The following podcast is run by a couple of former wheel turners and one pit guy. It's uh, meant for entertainment, not uh, not so much information, but sometimes there's some good information. Um, the opinions expressed are just, these are the morons on the show. Not necessarily right, not necessarily wrong, not uh, the views of any of the sponsors or anything like that. So uh, these guys, they're going to be talking, they might swear here and there, so if that offends you, uh, either uh, grow up or... Uh, Give a little permission for mom and dad. All right, race fans, Ryan Abel here. The one and only Burt Lehman, of course, Coach Krause in the house with us again tonight. Episode 230, two slash Kevin Burdick here tonight. Burdick's pulling a, pulling a Krause. He heard a motor this past week in Proctor. Hopefully he's got that thing ready to go. Lots of money on the line here for the next in the next couple of weeks for Wasota Late Model. So I'm pretty sure he's going to be ready. But uh, Krause, you know a little bit about hurting an engine. You got yours back together? That 29 star back ready to go or what? Yeah, we're back together, ready to rock. We had our go for this weekend and uh, had makeup features too at Viking. And um, just like everybody else, Mother Nature took it. So we're going to um, Move that makeup feature to this Saturday for the Supers. They have double features for our free grandstand night. Um, Central, Nap of Central Minnesota every year, Ryan Burt. Free grandstand at Viking Speedway this weekend. Pretty awesome thing they do. So we're getting pumped up. we got a big weekend coming up at Viking. Well, if you're not going to win the show, be the show. I mean, you got to do something memorable to get people coming back. Going around in circles, even winning, not that memorable. Do something colorful. I want to see the old 29 star fast and troublemaker. That's what I want to see. That'll get people coming back in the crowd. You know that as well as I do. Do it for the sport. All right. Episode 230 brought to you by Impact Health Sharing. So if you're in the market for health insurance, right? If you're maybe you're an employee and you don't get it through your boss, you got to pay for it. And you're like, man, I'm just sick of paying this and paying too much. If you have a business, and you have employees, if you're self-employed, if you're a trucker, farmer, whatever it may be, if you're paying for your own health insurance and you're looking at it and you're like, man, these deductibles are awful. I'm paying too much for, for, uh, for a monthly payment for something I barely ever use. I'm sick of going to a specific doctor. I might have a fit for you. Um, give me a call, text, hit me up on Messenger 218 969 one three eight zero and i can get you some information and a quick no obligation quote to impact health sharing been able to save people thousands of dollars on their health care and uh they can use that money elsewhere uh, do cool racetrack stuff you don't need it to get into the races this week at viking but you know there's other tracks in your area maybe you're maybe you can use it there if you're not going to viking so um impact health sharing bringing you episode 230 start off with a little sad note guys uh last week uh touched at the end of the show uh one of the late model drivers from out in the dakotas north dakota um had a pretty nasty accident sounds like i don't know all the details but i think it was a, a car motorcycle type deal and uh he was pretty touch and go and nick minsky um lost his life here this past week and tough hit for the racing community out there and just want to give our condolences to all the friends and family of nick minsky and i know he had a lot of kids so um that's a tough one right there so always always tough to lose somebody um the racing community is pretty tight knit so kraus uh everything rained out this past weekend did you catch any did you go to any races <laughs> or i mean everything kind of watched in your area or just just like me you caught it all online it was pretty much all online, man. It was, um, it was even hard chasing radar. I mean, we, we, I mean, it was just one of those points. I think, um, I think that just kind of stay home and watch. You know, thought about maybe going up to I ninety four, but there was weather moving in there, and <clears throat> they got their show done. And weather came in later, so I was pretty much sit on the couch and watch. Um, had the, got the car ready to go. Um, sat at obviously sat at Viking for a couple hours, and then she started raining and rained for about four hours, and we were done. So. I think it was just a good weekend to stay home and watch some racing. I see our old uh, our old rival there in the Super Stocks kind of snookered the old uh, reigning champ in the late models at I-94. Tyler said, man, I, I let one slip away. And it's like, well, you know, I got to be honest. Moss is a Super Stock guy. They're just better. It just is what it is. So um, so he uh, 
gave one away there. Sounds like it was a pretty good race. Bert, um, everything washed out in your neck of the woods? Did you get any racing in or? Uh, no, uh, all the racing I watched was from my recliner. Uh, all of Eastern Wisconsin was canceled Friday and Saturday. Um, Friday night into Saturday morning, most of the area got over an inch of rain. So it, most tracks were <laughs> canceling nine o'clock already Saturday morning because they knew it wasn't good. Plus, the forecast was like a hundred percent chance of rain throughout the day, although. By the end of the morning, it didn't rain anymore, but I mean, it's just too much rain leading into yeah. Saturday. Yeah, that was kind of the, the mm. I guess, the way it worked all pretty much all around the region. I got to give a donkey award to uh, the crew chief of the 83 team, the one to go 83 team, one to go show 83 team down at Sycamore. Uh, the jackass didn't go to the racetrack. Um, looked at the weather, figured he was Ryan Doppler, looked at it, and he's like, ah, you know, pretty positive this deal's not gonna happen and uh, i mean it looked like rain coming in it rained out everywhere i'm like i am not driving an hour to sit to get rained out especially at a place where so they don't do makeup features down there so at sycamore if they race the heats if they get the heats in and you paid to get in they just too bad so sad we're gonna keep your money no makeup features no money out to the drivers they're not splitting the money they just put it in their pocket i'm like not interested I'm not doing that. Right. that yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of horseshit. They did it last year to them guys. And uh, if you're not going to run makeup features, at least split the money, right? If yeah. you're not giving the money back, split the money. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. And I looked at it. I'm like, you know, nothing worse, right? As The one thing I do not miss about racing is, is tracking the radar, looking at it going, are they going to get them in? Are they not? I'd almost rather have it rain out like the night before and be like, I guess they're canceled. We'll just kind of make plans, do something else. The whole waiting game is just just annoying. So I, I decided not to go. Lo and behold, they got it in. And uh, um, the 83 street stock, Dave, he got second. So he had a good run. Um, kind of got held up there a little bit. Did not quite get a good start. He was kind of boxed in. And when he did get to second, too little, too late, kind of tried to track down the leader. Um, his, uh, his cousin, Brian, Kraus, you're gonna like this one. So kind of proud of him. I gotta be honest. I uh I kind of want to give him a prize, give him a medal for this. You ever start on the front row with somebody in a heat race and they're just literally trying to move you out of the line on the parade lap and they're trying to run you up the racetrack? Yeah, the the guy that was next to him tried doing that. He held his line, didn't freaking move, and that guy got a, a flat tire and he was crying and whining and sent his pit crew over yelling at him. He's like, huh too bad like we both there's plenty of racetrack here don't be trying to move me up and, and he held his line the other guy got a flat i'm like i've never been so proud that's a proud dad moment right there i'm proud of him Kraus, you ever have that happen i mean is that the right thing to do just hold your line and let it play out like it's gonna play out or what yeah hold your line or else just give him a nice big door slam um coming to the green and he's gonna let off now you're gonna get even a better start but Guys do whatever you want. They, they they push you up in the marbles, so you start in the marbles, or you push them in the slick, make them start in the slick, or whatever. But either door slam them or just hold your line. They'll learn their lesson. Exactly right. And if you let them, if you let them move you around, they're going to continue to do it. So you got to show them who's boss. And and uh, kind of had an interesting deal. They 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 ran the show through really quick. I mean, it literally downpoured immediately after the races. Well, he went across tech in the heat race. And I think he got 30 at a pretty, maybe second. He had a pretty good run in the heat. And, uh, there's a measurement cross from the bottom of the cross member to the ground that you can't go any lower than. So they have a minimum. So you, you can't, you can't go any lower. Well, he was a little bit low on that. Now remember on those peer stocks, kind of like a Wissota peer stock, it's not exact. You can't really ad adjust it, right? They can, they can, uh, put adjustable spring cups in there, but they got to weld them. So they're not able to adjust them. So he's like, well, shit, you know, like I, I don't really have time to take it all apart and grind it and do all that. So he kind of just slid back there in the, in the feature and fin figured I'm just not going to finish in a top five spot. Cause he knew they were going to remeasure it. So he got her fixed and ready to roll for this week. So we'll see how that goes. So guys, let's jump into uh top moments and stories of the week. 
um, brought to you by our friends over at Fastlane Motorsports and Powder Coating in Ashland, Wisconsin. Proud sponsors of the number one series in Wissota Racing, the Northland Superstock Series. Of course, Chris and the gang, they build the Galloper chassis. They do custom fabricating, sandblasting, powder coating, service a lot of uh, racetracks. You can get any part you need for your race car. Great group of people up in Ashland, Wisconsin. Um, check them out online. Give them a call. Um, that's uh, Fastlane Motorsports and Powder Coating in Ashland, Wisconsin. Got a little distracted there. So uh, thanks a lot, Chris, for all you do for racing. So, guys, number five, kind of the big story, the big race that happened. There was not a lot of racing in Wissota, but there was a big one. So they had a, a midsummer showdown deal up there, an invitational north of the border, Thunder City Speedway, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. And uh, the top story, guys, Team USA bringing back the money back to the right side of the border. Nothing against you Canadians up there. We love you, right? But the fact is the money <laughs> came back, right? They brought that monopoly money back down to the States. Ten grand to the win. I think maybe seven grand by the time it's all said and done. But Jason Vandykamp, uh, quite honestly, one of the best Midwest mod drivers ever to strap in in our area. Dude's a hell of a, hell of a race car driver. Pretty easy going guy too. Pretty good dude, and uh, cashed in ten thousand to win that one. Dave Kane, really good race there with Brandon Cop um, on night two in the finale in the modified division. Brando was too tight. I'm like, what the hell? Why is he not running the bottom? It was a place to be. Well, he was too tight. Kane probably would have got by, so he gave it everything he had up top. Him and Kane had a hell of a race, and uh, Rick Simpson getting it done in the super stock. So the Canadians did get one. They got to keep north of there, but. Despite some racing, guys, there was some drama. There was there was some drama. I know it's a racetrack, a dirt track race, a multiple day show drama. Who would have guessed it, right? So, before we get into that, did either one of you get a chance to watch on Dirt Race Central the racing action uh, Thunder Bay this past week? No, I did not. I just saw the incident that we're going to talk about. Yeah, Bert. Bert doesn't like Canada. <laughs> so he didn't watch it, kind of boycotting. He's a Packer fan, so I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, they don't even have hockey in, in Wisconsin, so I mean, it just is what it is. Um, Krause, I know you watched. I mean, there there wasn't a lot of Wissota stuff. Anything stick out to you other than we got a couple things I'm going to touch on? A little bit, a little bit of drama there. One, a couple things that one of them's kind mm -hmm. of a, I think maybe a couple donkey awards here, but well, uh, anything else stick out to you? Any shout outs to any of the any of the racers up there? No, I think I know we talked, um, looks like it was kind of a day race. I don't know exactly what time they started up there, um, but you're going to have a big special and finish it on Saturday night. Um, I think you better start a little later because the track got, the track got narrow, but end of the day, that's what causes drama too. Um, everybody fighting for that same lane. So you're going to get some drama, but you know, I know I thought Ryan, you said, I thought the crowd was maybe down a little bit too. Um, which is probably going to be the case if you start a little early. So I was a little bit surprised with that. I know they're up there for three days, but you're going to have the finale. You got to make sure that days you get the best track. Um, you know, the good car, the good car, well, the car counts are going to be the car counts, but the fan count. Um, you got to make sure you take care of them too. So I did watch a little. Um, like you said, Brandon Cop was trying, trying as hard as he can on the high side. He was battling there for a little bit and looked like Buzzy really didn't have nothing for either of those two. Um, he was just uh, kind of. Tyler Vernon. Oh, was that Tyler Vernon? I thought Buzzy was up there. Nope. No. Well, he's got to. He's <laughs> got to stop looking. He's got to stop painting his car like uh, like Buzzy. He wants to be fast. So uh, he was kind of there, but he wasn't really going anywhere. But Cop and Kane put on the show. Um, obviously, I'm going to take credit for Dave Kane's win because I had him on the not hot list. And what's he do? He goes up there and wins. So um, I'm taking full credit for that win. Um, Dave Kane there for him winning. Um, but, um, you know, the supers was, it was an okay race. I thought the, I watched a little bit of the qualifier, you know, Friday rained out, watched a little bit of Thursday. It looked like there was some good racing up there. Um, but like you said, you know, track position was huge. I know they had passing points and come a day race. And then Saturday you put those fast guys up, up top or up, up front and on a narrow track, it's going to be super, super tough to beat those guys. Yeah. Some guys came through the pack. Not a lot of passing. Um, so that was just some of the takeaways from that. And then, you know, I and then I think uh, the Florida Panthers had to take even the Stanley Cup away from Edmonton from Canada. So now so now you got the Canadians even more mad about what happened up there 
in Thunder Bay, and then plus what happened at the Stanley Cup. So, um, and and I can I I lived in Thunder Bay for a brief period. Um, I played for the Thunder Bay Flyers for about a couple months up there in the USHL. So I got traded up there. I had to move to Thunder Bay. So I I know the area a little bit and still adjusting to the miles per hour. I had a I had a Honda Accord up there, Ryan and Burton. I, the the kilometers and miles that wasn't and the liters for gas. <laughs> I, I, I had a hard enough time with the Minnesota's um, system down here for schooling. Um, it was hard enough for me, but um, you know, overall, great to see big money. It's good to see cars up there. I love I love the fact that it was a three day deal. But you can always do things different, and hopefully they hopefully they learn some some things that they need to do different. I thought it was a Thunder Bay Bombers or whatever. Isn't that what it was? Uh, Thunder Bay Bombers, Paro Racky up there, isn't that? <laughs> yeah. So a little, yeah. little shout out to Puka, Puka, who we missed. We got to get him back on the show here one of these days. But he has a he with Miss McGill is his other is his hockey podcast. So Carl Racky, little young blood, right? Thunder, isn't it the Bombers? Is that what they are up there? That was that- like a semi-pro old school team <laughs> um, kind of deal. But then, like I said, I, I was on the Thunder Bay Flyers for a little bit. But, yeah, Puka's been hounding me to get on his hockey podcast, too. So um, probably do that once. I'll get trapped again with that. But if I do that, I'm only going to do it once. One show and done. <laughs> well, hey, incidentally, the Americans are also mad about the Stanley Cup because the team down in North Cuba they actually won it, right? So, I mean, it's essentially Miami, North Cuba. Carlos, have you ever been to Miami? I have not been there. Just northern Florida. I have not been to Miami. Little Havana. Let's just say it is basically North Cuba down there. So, Canada and the United States did not win the Stanley Cup. They went to Cuba this year. So, a couple things teching. I had, a, I had a, several questions come in. When, when you're having a big three-day show, 10, I mean, we you want good teching. You do. You definitely want teching. But it sounds like to me, and again, I wasn't up there, right? But the fact is, is I saw some DQs, and I, I heard some stories about they were going to DQ other drivers in other classes, and then they overturned it. They were pretty finicky up there with the body rules. Um, I guess roof rake was a big thing up there and stuff like that. Kraus, your thoughts, right, as a racetrack. I mean, nothing wrong with teching, all for teching, but is that the time or place to really get finicky with freaking roof rake and stuff, or do you just look at it and say, look, you've been racing all year. We're not going to dick with it. We didn't tech you half the rest of the year, so we're just going to let it go now, give you a warning, or say something at the pit meeting. Your thoughts on how they went about DQ and a bunch of people for roof rake up there? <laughs> well, I was, it, it was, it's it's end of June. Um, and if they haven't had their tech guy say something, we got issues. Um, and then all of a sudden you're going to hire somebody else to come up there and do the job um, and then start DQing guys. Like, hold on here a sec. <clears throat> Let's work with the drivers. Let's work with the track. I know um, they had talked about, I know they're going to send some Wasota tech guys out west to help them get acquainted with things, some new stuff going on here. Um, but it's more of an informant. Let's help what to look for. And if you do find something like that, Let's give a one week notice. Hey, you know what? Let's get this fixed. You know, and here's the deal, Ryan, at the end of the day, and Bert, the driver's gonna be like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for telling me what the rules are. Thank you for giving me a one week grace period. Not say no, get out of here, you're DQ'd. Then you're gonna get all mad and you start throwing stuff. You're not gonna come back. You're not gonna spend your money. You know what I mean? Let's let's use our heads here a little bit on some. No, hey, you got you got illegal heads, you got uh, porter and polished heads or Brzezinski stuff. Yeah, you know what? Hit the road. Okay, but you know what? You got a little body infraction to say, hey, you know what? This needs to be changed an inch or this needs to be moved. You know, let's get this fixed next week. Um, If you got any questions, come talk to us before the races. We'll measure it. Let's common sense. Let's use our head. Let's do things the right way. So uh, when you told me about that and then, you know, I found out that they hired a tech inspector, you know, I'd be like, me and Viking hiring some other random guy to come over, step boundaries on my two tech guys, and he starts DQing everybody. Well, now my tech guy's going to be mad, and and vice versa. So let's let's work with people here, and you know, body rules stuff like that. One week grace period. Let's get it fixed. If you're going to ignore the rules, then yeah, hit the road. But let's work with drivers and try to make this work and try to make it right. Absolutely. So I know Bertich in here to kind of we got to give him a little love here. Yeah, we're going to give him a chance to talk. So, 
Well, the one thing, so let's face it, the two top guys up there over the last couple of years have been David Simpson and Cole Chernosky. Both them two are the, they're 1A, 1B up in Thunder Bay as far as winning races over the last couple of years. There's some other guys that are pretty darn good too, but them have been the two notable guys. Both of them involved in a little bit of drama over this past weekend, okay? So the first one, Chernosky, um, he actually got second, I believe, in the Superstock race. Rick Simpson kind of drove away from him. He had a pretty good hot rod. But in the mod race, and I think you guys saw this clip, and I think that's what we're what Bert was alluding to, there was a altercation between, I think it was him and Tanner Williamson, and there was contact made. And, and literally, Stevie Wonder looked at it and be like, holy shit, like that guy just yard sailed him drove right through him right so it looked like the 88 flat out drove and i don't know if something happened earlier in the race or i didn't i didn't watch the whole deal to see if there was something that maybe brought that up but contact was made chernoski gets dead sideways in the middle of the corner but because he's a good driver he saves it and then rolls down to the bottom and essentially parks in the front straightaway yellow comes out they put him to the back he's on facebook super pissed right he's like Freaking guy, and, and I'm reading all the comments, and they're all, clearly all they're all Chernosky fans because they're like, "Oh yeah, I mean he flat out drove into you," and they're like, "Everybody's like, I can't believe they made that call." Right call, wrong call. What do you what do you guys think? Um, it's the to me, it's the right call based on the entire sequence. Um, I mean, Chernosky. He def the other driver def definitely tried to tried to dump him. I mean, he ducked underneath him and turned just turned right right into him. Uh, apparently, though, he did a poor job. He you know he didn't do a well enough job to spin him out completely. Um, you know, Chernowski should have spun out, and then then it would have been interesting to see what call they made. Um, but I watched a clip, and the end of the clip that I saw just showed him slow down a little bit as he started down the straightaway. So, you know, I, I'm thinking, how could they make that call? But then I was, and then I thought, I wonder if he came to a stop on the front stretch and, and he's the reason that the, that the yellow came out. Cause the yellow wasn't going to come out uh, just from the hit because he was able to keep going. And yeah, it, it's a raw deal, but, Based on the entire sequence, it was probably the right call. <laughs> Cross, you see that deal? Yeah, here's uh, here's my take on this, and I'm not a big fan of this because it it happened to me a couple years ago, Ryan. I think it would have been a perfect case to throw them both to the back. I, I really do. The guy took a swing at him. At, you know, if they saw that, no rhyme or reason why he can't throw. Was it Williamson? Throw Williamson in the back, and then if Chernowski's gonna save it and then dynamite the brakes and stop in front of the crowd uh, in front of the stands and cause the yellow throw him to the back too. I, I think it would have been a perfect, perfect time to do it. Send a statement. No, you're not going to be taking people out intentionally. Cause that's what he did. Um, and as half his car was already missing. So obviously he was, he was already getting into it with some people, but uh, I, that would have been my take Throw them both to the back. The other alternative would have been Chernowski to the back for bringing out the yellow and literally kick the other guy off the racetrack for intentionally trying to wreck somebody. That probably should have happened because it was clear. It, and from what I've seen, the short little clip that I saw, and I don't know the whole backstory there on maybe something that happened in the corner before, but if that did, that was retaliation. But he definitely tried to jump him. So I can, or junk him. I can see why Chernowski was pissed, but Cole, dude, or any driver, if somebody flat out yard sales you like that on purpose, I'm not a big proponent of just like spinning out because probably going to wreck half the field if you do or whatever. But I don't know. He was going to lose one or two spots in that deal. He wasn't going to lose a bunch. He saved it. He did a hell of a job saving it. But man, oh man, I, I you can't stop partway down the straightaway and expect to get your spot back. I mean, that's just, I don't know. Bob Broking had a deal like that in, uh, in Superior last year, him and Brandon Cop got together coming off too, and Brando kind of slid across the track, and there was some pretty good contact made, but Bob saved it, and then he kind of like kind of stopped and kept going and kind of stopped, and finally he stops in the middle of the back straightaway, and they put him to the back, and he went ballistic. He was pissed. It's like, dude, like it happened like a half a straightaway later. Like, I mean, so, yeah, I think ultimately right call, 
I can see why Chernovsky was mad, but I don't think there's anything to be mad at the racetrack about on that one. More, more to be mad at that other driver, and they can work their shit out. The other drama, guys, was David Simpson got hosed. Bert, you don't. I don't think I told you about this deal yet. So, remember last week we talked. He wasn't even going to go. Right. Mm-hmm. He didn't. He. I don't know the whole story. Don't know their lovers quarrels. I don't know what's going on up there. But evidently, there's little bit of bad blood between the people running that show sounds like they sponsor some other cars and and simpson doesn't get along with them there's there's some back history there don't know all of it but so simpson said i don't i don't necessarily like you know we don't get along i don't like the format i i still sounds like there wasn't with soda points but i'm going to do a little research to see if they end up changing that or not i think for super stocks mods streets there definitely was with soda points the Midwest mods, I'm not 100% sure how that worked, but he wasn't going to go. So he went to Grand Rapids on Thursday, and then everything looked like rain. Pretty much everything canceled. He's like, well, shit, screw it. I'm going to head back up. I might as well race at home. Well, Thursday night, a guy by the name of Scott McKinnon, he hadn't pre-registered. So backstory here is they had to pre-register for the Midwest mod portion of this race. And then they they had the drawing beginning of last week, remember, because we picked them or we were going to pick them. They had the drawing and like the lineups were posted like several days before the race. So if you didn't pre-register, you weren't in. Now, keep in mind, passing points as well. Well, Scott McKinnon decides, hey, I'm going to race and uh, can I run the B model? I'll just take the back. And they said, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So he runs Thursday, tags the back. He goes from 10th to 4th in his heat race. And that passing points combined with finishing fourth gave him enough passing points to start sixth in the qualifying feature on, on night one. So David Simpson's like, well, shit, I, I might as well do the same thing. Like, I mean, if he did it, I'll, I'll come tag on Friday and I'll start in the back. He goes from eighth to second in his heat. That was enough passing points to put him outside of row number one in the, in the qualifier. Well, then they decide, well, I don't know if that's really fair. So you got to start sixth in the B. What? So he starts sixth in the B, wins the B. Now I'm looking at the lineup for the feature. He starts like 21st or something, or like based on like the people that qualified in, he should have started like 21st. He started 11th in the qualifying feature, which definitely made no sense. I'm like, well, how the hell's that work? I'm, I'm totally confused now. Is this is this a prime example of and Kraus, you and I both know this probably better than anybody, right? Is this a prime example of where talking too much and literally making your opinion no known puts a target on your back to just hawk tui on that thing and stick it in you from behind? <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Especially when you're <laughs> your hometown track and you're not going to show up and then you're going to, I don't know if he was, I think he was up on social media blabbering too. And everybody found out he wasn't going to be there. And everybody's like, Oh, why he's not going to be there. And then everything rains out. And then he decides he wants to race. So it's still not fair. You still have to do what's fair. You got to treat everybody the same. Uh, so you don't put yourself in those situations as a track, but yeah, there's definitely something fishy going on there. Yeah. I, I, that was a, that was a bad deal. Good to see him up there. Right. I think he ended up fourth or something. I mean, he, or I think he had him fourth in the qualifier. I don't know where he ended up in the A main, but he would have started outside front row in the qualifier. Probably a pretty good shot to win that or get second. He's been super fast. Could have changed the whole outcome of the weekend, but yeah, bad deal. Got to, I don't know who made that decision, but whoever that was, that dude or gal or whoever that was, they get a donkey award because that's bullshit. You you gotta be you you gotta do the same for everybody, whether you like them or not. That that's just not a cool deal. I'm I'm a I'm a David Simpson fan. He races a lot. And uh doesn't matter who it is, right? But the fact of the matter is you, you can't be screwing people over like that. That's terrible. All right. So that's enough on Thunder Bay. Great overall, though. Great. I mean, the place is awesome. Great, great experience. Great show. Great car counts. Some good racing. And uh, good to see them putting up some pretty darn good money um, in the middle part of the year here for the drivers. All right. Number four, race of the week. Bert. Name the class. Name the cl- No, it's not late models. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's not late models. All right. Street stocks. Street, we've been waiting for this, right? There's been some good street stock races, but Casino Speedway on Sunday had a dandy 
Um, boy, I think I'm going to give this race of the week honors right here. This could have been number one, but there's some other stuff that happened. Move over, boys. Maria Brooksick. Guys, she was battling for third with about seven, eight laps to go, pushed like a road grader in three and four, fell back to sixth. With like five laps to go, she's in sixth. I'm like, okay, she's probably going to finish fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever. And at the time, Andy Russell leading the way in 99. And here comes Braden Brower. Flickinger was pretty darn good in the 15 as well. He was battling up front, had a really good hot rod. Closing laps come down, right? And uh, Braden Brower slides to the inside, puts heavy pressure on Rosso coming for the white. I'm like, ooh, this is going to get good. Brooks is still battling third, fourth, right? She's kind of not in the picture. They come down the back straightaway, and Braden Brower did what he does. He went for it all. He went for the win, cleared him, complete clear slide job on Rosso, overshot it. Rosso comes down the hill, but because he had to check up, Maria Book- Brooksick plugs the gap. Little bit of contact made, a little right side romance. Beats him to the line, and uh, last lap pass, uh, two for the price of one, coming off four. Super exciting finish. Dirt Race Central has the action. Guys, your thoughts on that race? It was it was fun to watch. Uh, I did not see it. Uh, that was my next. It was the next race on my list to watch, and I didn't get to it before the show. That's so a donkey me, award. Give me. I was just gonna say, give me a donkey award. Yeah, that's a donkey <laughs> award. That, that's 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 some horseshit right there. <laughs> uh, it's on Dirt Race Central, too, on their Facebook page. They actually share that highlight. So, Krause, I mean, Casino Speedway, when that place is on, right, when that place is good, is there more exciting racing than that little bullring in Watertown, South Dakota, to watch? No, there's not. It's 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 usually pretty racy, usually pretty wide. It's got a cushion. You run the top, run the bottom, and it's just so tight. Um, there's going to be contact, and... That was a 100% classic case, Ryan, when you're sitting in third place watching the leaders battle and you're sitting there going, they're going to wreck each other. They're going to wreck each other. They're going to do something dumb. I got to be close enough. And Maria, she's she's super smart. She's always patient. And like you said, she probably wasn't there, but worked her way back up to third. And she saw her chance. And I tell you what, and, and Brower was, it, he's going to, he'll learn his lesson a little bit. He, th- he threw a Viking Speedway slider at Casino. And, <laughs> He didn't need to. I mean, he went in and he hit the gas. I'm like, dude, he's going to end up in the parking lot. And I'm like, where's he? And then, he? then you can see he finally realized it, too, that I went in way too hard. And I think Rosso was even like, what the world was that? And he checked up and stopped and he got door slammed and two of them were in the wall coming to check her. And she came to line. It's a great finish. Crowd was going absolutely nuts. That was the best part about that deal. Uh, she's got a lot of fans there. And then you know, you got Braden Brower. He's the traveler coming in. Nobody wants him to win. You know, the locals don't want to see him win. And then Rosso's a good guy, too. He's he's a good competitor. So just great to see a good finish, and uh, especially at Watertown. And it was just fun seeing the fans and their reaction and, and he's hooting and hollering. And you could hear them playing his day on Dirt Race Central. Yeah, that was a fun one for sure. Bert, you're going to have to check that out because it, it's I'll, definitely I'll check that it's out. worth taking some time and watching that for sure. All right, number three, Gopher State Duo. Yes, you heard it right. Minnesota late model drivers maybe gaining some traction uh, leading into their home state run here. Um, good good couple nights there for um, Dustin Sorensen and the B1 bomber, Brent Larson, both of them getting a podium. They ran three nights. They ran last night as well. We're doing the show. It's Tuesday. But Brent Larson come from pretty far back on a third place finish there. I think he started eighth or whatever. I think I on uh, on night one got third. <clears throat> Dustin Sorensen led a bunch of laps, ended up getting a second place finish. So could those two, could we expect to see Brent Larson, Dustin Sorensen rattle off some top fives and contend for some wins? Literally, there's what is there? There's three races next next coming weekend. You got I-94, Grand Forks, Ada. Then you have three XR races, right? And then you also go back to Minnesota. You got the go for 50. I mean, there is literally three, six, seven, I guess, eight counting prelims, eight possible races kind of on their home turf. Can you over and under between uh, be combined on these two over and under four podium finishes over that stretch for those two over how many races? Eight. So 16 opportunities. I'll go with the push. 
Push. Okay. Coach. Um, I'm going to go with the under. Under, under four. So less than four. Correct. I, I, yeah. I mean, let's face it. They, they, they're not getting a surplus of podiums, those two drivers, but, uh, Tell you what, Brent Larson got a brand new car. He's been kind of sporty um, since getting that brand new rocket out there. Dustin Sorensen coming into his own. I'm going to cheer for I'm going to go with the under as well, but I'm going to cheer like crazy for the over. I would like to see both of those two with a great run on their home turf here this weekend so or the, over the next week or so, so hopefully they can get her done. Number two, biggest rivalry going on right now in, in uh, over the last week or so. So in the Hell Tour, UMP Summer Nationals, a little bit going on there between old Turbo and the high side hustler, Jason Fager, a little rivalry there. And in the USMTS action, number one and number two in points right now, not playing very nice together, Jake, Tim, Jim Chisholm. Bigger rivalry. Why? And is it good for racing? Bert, you go first. Um, I'm going to say at the moment, the biggest, the bigger one is Turbo versus Fager. Just from the fact that um, right now they're racing against each other pretty much every day. So, you know, there's, there's no time for uh, to let things calm down a little bit. If you want to say, because they're racing against each other pretty much, you know, day after day after day. And uh, it's definitely good for racing. Racing needs more of it. I mean, that's what gets excitement going and what draws fans into the stands. Yeah, Fager kind of punted Turbo there a little bit. Kind of. Fager, I shouldn't say that. Fager slid him for the lead tight. It was close. Turbo didn't lift <laughs> and drove into the back of him. And here's the deal. So, yeah, I'll, and you guys can punch the buttons below. Krause is a racer, so we'll get his thoughts. Fager slid him and little contact made. And then Turbo spins out to the left. Now, typically, if you get right reared by somebody in the left front, Krause, which way does your car go? You, should, you would think it'd go to the right. You'd go to the right. So Turbo spins out to the left. So he's on the pump, and maybe it locked up his tire. I don't know, but I don't know. I, I think if Turbo breathes off the brake, off the off the pedal there, or just pumps the brake a little bit, he clears them. Maybe crosses them over, goes on, lives another day. Well, let's just say the last couple nights of the Hell Tour. Um, Turbo did the, exactly the same thing. He was doing right side romance whenever he had to, including the Fager. I think that one was on uh, on purpose. But um, Turbo is not a guy afraid of a little contact, so a little bit of rivalry there for sure. And and of course, week one of the Hell Tour, Turbo won. Week two of the Hell Tour points, Jason Fager won. So there's that as well. Coach Kraus, um, your thoughts on this rivalry? Which one's stronger? Is it good for racing? Yeah, it, it, you got to go with Turbo and Fager, and um, just because it's it's more people know who Tyler Herb is. Um, you know, Chisholm and Tim are coming. You know, and they're a little bit more regional. Obviously, we're going to know who they are, but you know, I don't think the national late model people quite know who Jim Chisholm and uh, Jake Tim are yet. They're going to because um, they're both up and comers. Um, but you know, I you know, listening to Jason Fager's interview last night. Uh, he praised Tyler Herb the whole time, how good a car he has, how good he's been running, um, how fast he is. I'm just happy to be able to compete and beat him. Uh, Turbo, on the other hand, is up on Snapchat. He's on social media, posting pictures. He's peeing like a dog on the roof of his car <laughs> after he wins. You know what I mean? So it's more of a one-sided deal right now, which is fine. It's It's what the sports need. It's what the Hell Tour needs, to be honest with you. It 100% needs that. Um, Chris Steppen's doing a good job of playing it up a little bit, too. Um, he's usually typically not that kind of guy, but he knows when to promote and know when to, you know, you know, stick a sword in the side there and get her going a little bit. So um, it's definitely good for the sport. It's good for the Hell Tour. Um, it's good for Turbo. It's good for all those guys. So uh, it's fun to watch, and uh, it's fun having Turbo on that deal because usually bull rings and, He's not afraid to rough up those guys. So uh, it's going to be fun to watch the next, um, you know, few weeks here, how that pans out. Yeah. And I got to be honest, I, I, I'm not, I'm a fan of all of them, but I, I like it a little bit more if they're John at each other. Like let's, I mean, the fans are more invested probably than the drivers are here, but play it up a little bit. I want to see the Fager, but Fager's probably pretty smart, right? He's probably sitting there going, 
I don't know that there's a more popular guy in, in dirt late model racing than Turbo. So if I start this heel thing and I'm start bickering on Turbo, I'm gonna lose all my fans because they're all Turbo fans. So maybe he's kind of smart in this one. Maybe he's kind of picking his battles there. But I'm gonna go with the modified one because I mean that's the premier modified series in the country, the US MPS modifieds. Jake Tim, Jim Chisholm, one and two in the national standings right now. And and uh boy, I tell you what, I mean. Neither one of them, when the door opens, they're taking it. It just is what it is. There was a restart the first night here this weekend, and Jim Chisholm, the door opened, or uh, Jake Tim let the door open a little bit. Jim Chisholm came in, gave him a little right side romance, and a little bit later in the race, Jake Tim did exactly the same thing and clobbered him into the fence, and and uh, Jim Chisholm wasn't real happy. Well, you can't be upset if you kind of use them up five laps earlier, right? It just You can't be upset about it, but... I tell you what, it's good for racing. I mean, all four of these drive talented, but in modified racing, Jake Tim and Jim Chisholm are extremely fun to watch right now. So if you don't, if you haven't watched much USMTS stuff, you, you need to jump on Racing Dirt and check out their shows because it is really, really good. Bert, well, I'm curious as to um, what you two think of the two incidents. I mean, to me as a fan, I didn't have a problem with either move. I mean. Tim left the door open and Chisholm went for it. And that's what a racer is supposed to do. And, you know, vice versa a little bit later on in the race. So I, what, I mean, I guess, you know, when you're the driver and in the moment moment, uh, you know, you probably look at things differently, but I guess I was, I didn't even fully understand why Tim was so upset. Well, he got passed and he's been getting well. passed <laughs> quite a bit by Jim Chisholm. So there's probably that that's, that probably has a little something to do with it, right? Jake Tim has kind of been the guy here, you know, end of last year, rolling into the beginning of the year. Jim Chisholm has been really freaking fast, and he's been kind of driving by him. So I'm guessing racers, we all have a little chip on our shoulder, right? So if there's contact is one thing, but if it's a if the guy that's beating you or that's taking wins from you is the guy that initiated the contact. You're 10 times as mad instantaneously because because of that. So, Carlos, your thoughts? Well, I think the other thing you got to add in, too, is um, a lot of bickering about Jim Chisholm being cheating. Um, tire samples be getting tested, you know, some other words about trash control. So that gets around with these drivers. So you know, all of a sudden, Jake Tim gets passed by him, and you start bickering. Well, you, you might think that guy's cheating. So there's been some stuff going on with that. So this series needs it, too. It 100% needs stuff like this, um, especially with your top two guys right now. It's absolutely awesome. So, again, it's fun to see. It's going to be fun to watch, give you a little excitement, a little something, turn the USMTS on and say, hey, what are those two guys going to do? Hope they're going to do something stupid again tonight. For sure. And somebody protested Joe Chisholm's tires, I think, at Deer Creek here a couple weeks back. He did get the samples back, and and he was good to go. Um, he, the, he turned out to be legal on that, but yeah, there's, if you're losing, right. If you're, if you're extremely fast and all of a sudden somebody steps it up and they're driving by you, all of a sudden starts, stuff starts playing in your head. You start wondering why for sure. So it's going to be fun to watch those two rivalries. It's going to be a great week of the hell tour for sure. And number one, I think the biggest storyline in our region for sure, right. The upper Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and all that South Dakota, torrential downpours halt a lot of racing and i mean i'm talking about literally flooding everywhere i mean husitz was supposed to have you know the high banks uh husitz high banks nationals or whatever it was called and the husitz hustle holy shit right i mean literally if you're a dirt fan you've literally seen this online but i mean seemingly overnight. I mean, imagine Bert being camped at a racetrack, right? You're camped out, it's pouring out, and all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, holy shit, what the hell happened? The water's like up over the floor in the motorhome. I mean, it literally looked like freaking Lake Superior. And then you look at Spencer, Iowa, completely underwater, Hibbing, Minnesota, tons of flooding, Cook, Minnesota, um, Park Jefferson literally looks like it's a grandstand out in the middle of the ocean. It's like, what the hell just happened? I mean. Mankato, huge flood in Mankato with the part of the dam coming off. I mean, unbelievable. And I mean, hearts go to all the all the families out there that maybe got displaced or lost. A lot of people lost a lot of stuff. But 
I mean, have you guys, I mean, it's one thing to have some rain, but we've had a lot of rain. I mean, have, have you guys witnessed anything like this that you can remember in any summer where the rain has been this bad and literally racetracks are completely flooded like this? Have, have you seen anything like this? I mean, in the past, I mean, you've seen, you know, an instance here, an instance there where, you know, there's one racetrack that's flooded. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've just, I mean, last summer we couldn't get rain. I mean, we were begging for rain, you know, for, not on weekends, but, you know, during the week for the farmers. And this year, you know, every day it's raining. And um, I mean, there's been years where there's been rain out, you know, this many rain outs, but just the amount of rain that we get every time it rains and to see, you know, just across the entire upper Midwest, just, you know, the rate, I mean, and in these situations, you know, um, you know, racing just isn't as important as, you know, the safety of the fans, drivers and everybody else involved. Absolutely. Kraus, I mean, what's it like in your area? I mean, I know you guys got quite a bit of rain. I mean, you got a lot of flooding down there in the Alexandria area too. No, not in this area. A little bit more down south, which it's just been wet. You know what I mean? It's just been just steady rains. Um, and it's like Bert said. Bert, you said it best. You said upper Midwest. It, it, we're talking a five-state area here mm -hmm. from the Dakotas through Minnesota down to Iowa on over into Wisconsin. I mean, it's a five-state area where this is going on. So, um, yeah, when well, we've had some rain, been pretty fortunate enough to be, you know, somewhat um, – on the drier side of things, but I mean, it, it it's wet around here and everything planting, all that stuff has been pushed back. So no, this, this, this is crazy. When you, when Bert says upper Midwest, you're 100% true. I mean, it's the whole five state area. All right. So we've had enough, right? We've had enough. There's enough rain. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's going to rain, let's have it, you know, it's, it's like anything right in the right amounts, not so bad at the right times, not so bad, but Holy shit, let's settle down with this rain. All right, let's get into a little fan feedback brought to you by Nick Hoff over at Hard Charger Performance Specialties out in Sydney, Montana. Nick been building engines now over 20 years in the in the industry. Does a lot more than that. He has a dyno, um, builds gears. He does a lot of stuff. Um, he'll build engines for anything from street rods to street stocks to late models and everything in between. Had a lot of success. I've ran his stuff, so I can speak for it that he builds a good piece and very knowledgeable guy, fun to work with, overall good guy. Also, if you're a Wissota guy, you run a crate engine, you might need that fixed. Well, let's be honest, it's a crate engine. You're going to need that fixed. It just is what it is. Well, where where else do you want to go? Go to Nick. Nick Nick is a certified engine repairer for the Wissota crate engines. Um, if you're out in the area, you can drive it to him, and you can also call him. He's got some pretty good shipping options. He can kind of get you hooked up on how to get your stuff sent back and forth. But you can get a hold of Nick at 406-478-4437. That's Hard Charger Performance Specialties. So I have a few different questions. I got multiple questions. We get a lot of feedback coming in. So thanks to the fans for sending this stuff in. It's super cool to hear from you. Um, as always, if you do have any feedback, any fan questions, bold predictions, anything you can, you can send them directly to me, Bert coach, send them to the one to go show Facebook page. Um, just send them on over. We love hearing from you. Got a kind of a funny one here. <laughs> so based on the Thunder Bay deal up in our area, Bert, when I say my area, I live in Illinois now, but I'm talking Kibbing, Proctor, Superior, Grand Rapids. That's my home turf, right? Ever since I grew up, I mean, it was kind of a tradition. You start the night off with the Canadian national anthem followed by the American national anthem and you carry both flags around the track. That's just what you do. Both flags are waving at all of our racetracks, Canadian and American. Well, he asked, he goes, the Southern tracks though, right? You get down to South Texas, right? New Mexico, Arizona. Do they play the Mexican national anthem at their races? Like we play the Canadian. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of <laughs> laughed out loud when I saw that. I'm like, I think it's a little different there, guy. Got to be honest. I, I, There's Canadians crossing the border over with their haulers to race. I, Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know that people are coming up from Tijuana to be raced. I don't, I don't think they're doing that down there. But have you guys ever been to any tracks down there? Do they, in fact, play the Mexican National Anthem? Is that a thing? I've never heard it before. I do not know. <laughs> so if you're a fan, if you've been to any southern tracks that are near the border, 
punch the buttons, let us know. Is this a thing? I don't know. I'm going to have to maybe catch some winter racing down there to find out. I did go to uh, Casa Grande down there, and I know they didn't play it there, but it'll um, be interesting to see. All right, got one here from Dylan. This is kind of an interesting one. Dylan Racer out in Jamestown, North Dakota. He says, uh, fan of the show, uh, question for you. Had a moment, threw my helmet at another driver here about a week ago. Got DQ'd. In fact, they towed my car out of the parking lot and booted me out of the facility for the night. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so I come back. I'm thinking of my, to myself, I'm going to come back. I'm going to race the following week. I get a certified letter that says, I think it was a certified letter, but he got a letter saying, um, suspended for one more week and a $300 fine. Is this fair? Should they, is that too much? And what is your thoughts on the fact that I, I tried to reach out to the track to talk to him about it? Nobody called me back. Nobody answered. He goes, quite honestly, I wanted to apologize because I kind of felt like a dumbass because I probably shouldn't have thrown my helmet at another guy. But the fact of the matter is I was just trying to reach out. Kraus, I don't know what the policy is at Viking, but let's say somebody throws their helmet at another driver, probably get kicked out for the night. If you do decide as a track that you're going to suspend that driver for one additional week and fine them, is it just a straight up certified letter or are you going to actually talk to the driver and be like, look, I, you're getting a letter, but here's what's happening. Should there be more communication on that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you probably DQ him for the race. Um, I know fine them. I know we're trying to stay away from Wissota for these things because because you throw a helmet at a guy, is that worth 30 and a 1,000? No, I don't believe so. Um, take it upon yourself to the track level. Um, you want to DQ him for the race and find him and not pay him for that night, that's fine. But if you're going to do anything additionally, um, basically our protocol at Viking is, hey, we have board meetings on Monday. Anything like this comes up, we're going to discuss it. Um, and we we'll, we probably more than likely invite that driver to the meeting, sit down and tell him face-to-face, -face, or myself as a promoter, our president would call him, say, hey, this is what we decided to do, or you want to come voice your opinion. You know what I mean? Come to the meeting, apologize. You know what? Maybe you're going to get, you know, maybe the guys be like, yeah, we understand. Hey, we get it. You're a first time offender. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that go on to it. Heat of the moment decisions, Ryan, Bert, are usually the wrong ones. Um, so sometimes you have to sit back, take it in, have a meeting, especially if your board ran. Um, you can you get nine different opinions, which sometimes can be good, sometimes can be bad, but you know, take it in and then make sure you communicate well to the driver, to his face. If he doesn't want to come to the meeting, then yes, you have to call him. If he's not going to accept your calls, then you might have to get to a certified letter. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that was the case. And um, maybe that driver is that maybe he didn't accept calls. Maybe he didn't accept that. We don't know, but take the right protocols. Make sure you do things the right way. So the next question in relation to that is, have you ever been booted out for throwing something at another driver or anybody at the racetrack? I have not thrown anything. Hold on now. I've been racing for 27 years, Bert and Ryan. Um, I believe I have not thrown anything. Um, uh, maybe on who's number one finger, but that stays attached to me, so I didn't technically throw it at somebody. Um, but I have not. Um, I've only had one incident on track where I was DQ'd. That's the only time. So, um, but no, never um, chucked a wrench or I threw a garbage can one time. Me and Don Shaw got into it. And I threw a garbage can on the ground, um, hit a guy in the foot. But other than that, I didn't throw anything at somebody. <laughs> How about that hockey game? You ever throw shit on the ice as a coach and get booted out of the game? I've thrown one thing on the ice in my career. My very, uh, uh was my first year. It was. First year as a head coach here in Alec, um, we got hosed bad in a playoff game. Ended our season. We had a goal call off, and it was a goal. I threw a water bottle across the ice. I didn't get fined or suspended or anything because they knew I was mad. That's the only time I've ever thrown anything on the ice as a coach. I threw a water bottle on the ice. I may have lost a track championship in Hibbing um, for throwing a lineup board at the president of the racetrack at the time. And uh, I, got, I got wrecked. I think I got wrecked like on lap two of a feature and I saw Ryan Flotten and Stearns got caught up in a deal and it was a point average deal and we're over there at the pay window later and I, I took the lineup board and I 
fucking wailed it right at the official, at the president. I said, here, take your fucking point average lineup and stick it in your ass. You just cost me more money again with voting for this stupid shit. And they still have it today. But uh, I had like a 30 point lead at the track and they said, yeah, you don't need uh, you're DQ'd for the night um, for that. And you really don't need to come back next week either. So I went to Cedar and uh, yeah, a couple of my sponsors were a little upset because we had a pretty commanding lead in the points. Track points back then were kind of a bigger deal than they are now. But um, I, I have thrown a tire at, at a driver before. I, I know I had a pit guy throw body panels at, I mean, we probably needed anger management classes. Thank God, right? We didn't have social media because there would have been all kinds of there would have been all kinds of Ryan Aho videos and pit crew videos on social media if uh, they had that twenty years ago. Let's just say that. Um, Bert, uh, how about the MJ camp? He, he, was he pretty level headed, or uh, was there the occasional I'm going to chuck something? I was steering wheel chucker too. I did that a um, bit too. While I was on the pit crew, he was always pretty level headed. I never really saw him get mad. Um, but apparently, one night uh, I wasn't at the races at this time. They were racing in Manitowoc, and um, he got him and Tom Nayert were involved in a wreck. And, uh, so, um, him and Tom Nayard apparently were arguing with each other and MJ must have said, well, I got another car, car in the garage. So, you know, basically say, <laughs> you know, just watch it on the track because I got a backup car if I need it. I like that kind of stuff right there. You got to have a little passion behind it. Bert, you had a question as well. You said that, uh, you were going to have a question for us in the fan feedback. What do you got? Yeah, watching the races at Lernerville, uh, the Lucas races, um, you know, Lernerville, they don't have guardrails or, you know, they don't have any fencing on the corners. And uh, we were getting updates from one of the guys in our group chat whenever a car would would flip over in the corners. And uh, I saw two cars flip over while I was watching. And, you know, I, I always just kind of assumed that not having fencing was safer but with those flips, and we saw um, RTJ flip at Boone, what was it last year or the year before, in a similar situation. So as a driver, um, which do you prefer to race on a track with or without fencing? And which do you think is safer with or without fencing? Well, Coach, I'll let you go first. I, I do have some thoughts because I think yeah, I'll let you go first, though. Well, Bert, I grew up without anything on the corners because I grew up at Viking Speedway, first place I've ever raced. Um, I'm going to tell you this, if there was fencing and concrete at Viking Speedway, um, there we, you, you might be talking more fatalities and more injured people and more wrecked race cars um, just because of the fact that uh, your speeds, stuff like that. Um, and like I said, uh, first thing, Ryan, the first thing my dad told me before I got in the car is, if you feel yourself go off the high side at Viking, turn down the track. Don't try saving it. You're going to hook your right rear and you're going to roll. He, I, I remember it to this day, Ryan. And when I first started racing, make sure you go down the track. And I was a rookie. What do you think I did? I blew her off the high side. But as soon as it went right into my mind, what I do, I turn down the track. You know, saviors different. Yeah, know if you get hit and punted, that's a different ball game. So, um, so I grew up without that. Um, I don't like the walls at I-94. I don't like concrete. Um, fencing's a different deal. Um, you know, we saw a horrific crash out in Montana. Where was that? Was that in Montana, right? Gallatin. Gallatin. Yeah. We saw a horrific crash with a super stock there that had wall was too low and not fencing. Um, you know, what I will tell you, Bert, is as a driver, especially when you go to a new track, go – and another thing my dad told me is when you're out there on the parade lap, and obviously I didn't listen to him because I hit tractor tires, look for tractor tires, look where the wall is, look to see where the, you know what I mean? Know your surroundings, Bert. And sometimes you got to walk around a track. Um, I used to do it all the time. Like, where's the scale? You know what I mean? Know your surroundings. Know, a lot of times you go to a new track, Bert, and you've never been there. Um Go walk the track. Go look. Oh, there's tires here. There's no wall. There's concrete here. Every track is different. So 
Um, as a driver, I'm telling you, as young drivers, old drivers, or whatever, know your surroundings. Um, don't just get out there and assume, you know, look to see where tires are, look to see where walls are at. But like I said, I grew up with no walls or no fencing like that, so I'm used to that. Um, it, it's just every track's different. I mean, some of these places, there's there's housing developments off the corners, so you have to have walls and fencing there. So, it's, you know, I, I wouldn't call it a preference, Bert. Um, I think you got to leave it to the track. Hopefully they made the right decision. Um, but, and, and again, we got to do, Ryan, we talk about wall openings all the time. Mississippi Thunder got rid of that crazy wall opening um, and stuff like that. So it, it's a heck of a topic because you see a lot of wrecks these days. You know, Deer Creek guys up on the wall or Cedar Lake guys going over the wall. And, um, it's it's a heck of a conversation, Bert. It's a good question. And, you know, as a driver, I'd rather not see a concrete or anything like that and something I can maybe bail and slow down and give myself some time. But things happen so fast, sometimes you're just going to roll no matter what. So, I think it depends on what's on the other side, right? So if you have, like, Vikings got a pretty long, like, if you go off the track at Viking, it's pretty wide open, right? But there's some places you go off the track and you're in the freaking trees. It's straight down. You know, they got rocks and piles of stuff back there or, like you said, houses. So it just depends on what the surrounding is. Um, in a perfect world, the safest thing, in my opinion, is if it's got a big, long, like smooth transition where you, you don't really need fencing and all that because there's plenty of room to go. But if you're going to come to an abrupt stop because you hit a pile of rocks or you're going to end up in a big freaking pond back there or something like that, you you better have fencing. And you know, it sounds funny, but I'm telling you right now, there's there's tracks out there that have no walls, no fencing. Then literally, you go off the track and you're out in the middle of freaking like water, right? Like I, I mean, so I mean, some you just got to know what the surroundings are. So I think it it's very very much dependent on what's outside the track and how much room you have, in my opinion. So good question there, Bert. Kevin sent one here. Uh, sprint car talking about buggies. Sunshine, Tyler Courtney, of course, he won night one, the prelim night uh, at Houston. The rest of it got rescheduled for, I believe it's Labor Day weekend. They're going to have that at Houston. And then uh, because he's a high limits guy, he looked at his schedule and said, well, shit, our, our weekend's washed. Where can I go? So he found a couple IRA sprint car races, pretty good car counts, doubled up. He won three races this past weekend. Two-part question for you guys. A, how much of an advantage does this give him that he's getting more seat time, more laps, more races? And B, does this automatically make high limits better than the world of outlaws because they're allowed to do this? Well, um, you know, I, I haven't raced, so, but I always hear that the more seat time that you have, the better off a driver is. I, I've interviewed a lot of drivers and, you know, I always ask them about their racing experience and, you know, they'll, they'll bring up seat time a lot. And or that's another reason why they'll go out of state and race at specials because they want to get more seat time or race against the best of the best. Because I had one driver tell me, you don't learn anything unless you're racing against the best. And when you race against the best, that's when you try things and you learn things. So um, to me, seat time, getting more seat time is never uh, a bad thing. And, um, oh, it, whether high limit is better. Um, I think just the fact that they're allowed to race wherever they want to race is, is better for the drivers because it gives them more freedom. Um, and, uh, I think there's a little, I mean, you guys, somebody shared a post, uh, that the high limit had sent out stating that their drivers were. Uh, racing with the world of outlaws or something because they have the freedom to do so or some, something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, they were, they had a post and they're like, yeah, some are racing in Skagit and some are racing yeah. here and some are racing there because our guys can do that. And uh, that was definitely a slight because that was one of the big things that the world of all or the high limit guys hated about world of outlaws is you can run four shows and they got, pretty good money and they got their reasons for doing it. But if you're a guy that likes to race every weekend and it get rain, gets rained out, you don't want to sit at home. I mean, with the weather that we had, 
it's very, very possible that a, you could have two weeks of World of All Out race out, rain out, and next thing you know, you didn't race for a month, right? So, I don't know. So, Kraus, your thoughts? Yeah, well, um, you're looking at a spitting image right here, Bert. It's about seat time. You know what I mean? Back when I ran three nights a week, Ryan, and you did the same thing too. You can vouch for this. I I was winning 15, 20 features a year and, you know, compete with the things. All of a sudden you drop down to race one night a week. You're behind the eight ball, Bert. I don't care. Say what you are, but you just are. So, uh, you know, and, you know, Tyler Courtney's, he does not have a big, long history of 410 sprint cars because um, he came from midgets, USAC. I know he's obviously ran Chili Bowl and stuff like that, but he doesn't have a ton a ton, ton of seat time. He's got the backing. He's got the sponsorship. Go race. Um, and like I said, I got a whole bunch of stuff later in the show about Tyler Courtney with my pickums and bold predictions and all that good stuff. So um, definitely, definitely a huge advantage with high limits right now. Um, definitely handcuffing them world outlaw guys. I, I think so. It's your, it, like I said, I always before you're the only people you're really hurting are the fans. You're killing the fans because you don't let them Donnie shots and gravel and all those guys go run places. That's who you're really hurting is the fans here. They got to get that change and get that straightened out. Absolutely. All right. So I got one here from a Wiso a disgruntled Wissota racer. And uh he kind of threw some he kind of threw some shade. Um, but there's more than just these couple drivers doing it. But he says. There's three Cameron, Wisconsin drivers playing the pull-off game in Wissota Racing right now. Is this ridiculous? If they're not running first or second in the feature, they are literally pulling off. Is this okay, or should they grow a pair and race? Is this bad for racing that your premier drivers are A, pulling off and not putting a show on, and then B, making the show even worse because they're coming back the following week, starting on the front row and, sh and basically stinking up the whole program. Sandbagging shouldn't be a thing. Should they alter? Should they change how they do the point average or just get rid of it all together? Your thoughts. I'll let coach go first. Ah, well, uh, <laughs> tell you what, Ryan, obviously somebody tipped off with soda because this has been a discussion at the soda board meetings. Um, and it's happening, and it's happening at a high rate. We all know who's doing it and what's going on, um, and it's a problem, it, and it, it's wrong. It 100% is, and something needs to be done. Um, you know, I know it's been done in the past, too, guys that show up, hit as many as openers as you can at tracks, and you don't like where you could draw and make a lap, pull in, and, oh, I'm going to come back three, four, or five weeks later. Guess where I'm going to be starting? I'm going to be starting on the pole when I'm running for national points. So it's a problem right now. It's a big problem right now. Um, you know, our my area over here, not really, not a whole lot of guys do it. I nine day four and Viking is kind of two tracks and a lot of back and forth same drivers. Uh, don't really get into it. A lot of guys don't run for national points, um, and some do. They're sitting up on top right now, so maybe they're going to start. So, um, but that's a problem right now. Something needs to be done, and hopefully. I don't know if we're going to talk about it tomorrow or night, tomorrow at the meetings or not, um, but something needs to be done with this people pulling off and point average. and Because it's not like the old days, Ryan, where you had how many guys traveling? You know what I mean? You had a ton of guys doing it and traveling. and didn't doesn't benefit you. Uh, right now, it may end up deciding a national championship just because you're starting up front the whole time. So it's a problem, and it, so it is talking about it. Hopefully, we can get something addressed here shortly. Well, and it has altered national championships because there's several drivers that not only did that, but they were vocal about Kurt Myers was vocal when he won the national points. He's like, you fucking right. I did that. He goes, I don't make the rules, you know? So, I mean, th this ain't on the drivers. They don't make the rules, right? They're, they're just taking advantage of a stupid ass rule that's, that's outdated and should be gone. I gave Stern shit, right? And because he's like, they need a donkey award for having this. I'm like, remember now, this freaking rule started in your hometown. It started in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and uh, he's aware. Like he he, he kind of chuckled. He's like, ah, yeah, for for sure. But you know, there's some people talking about, well, just get rid of the if they DNF, that shouldn't count. No, you got to get rid of it all together. Because one of my favorite things as a race fan, and Bert, I'm gonna let you touch on this as a fan side of it is. 
if a guy gets a flat on lap one or two, back in the day, you change that tire and you're going to try to get as far forward as you can. Well, now, if you're not racing for track points, you get a flat, you pull off, oh, whatever it is, what it is, we'll start up front next time. You don't typically get that storyline of, that guy changed the tire, came from the back, got up into the top three, won the race. You don't have that. So, Bert, as a fan, how much does this stuff annoy you? Um, just the th- I, Maybe you don't see it over there, but you understand what's happening. The thought process behind this, as a fan, does this bother you? Well, it bothers me if, uh, I mean, you said if they're not running first or second. They, so if they're running in third place, they're pulling off. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I mean, because a third doesn't do nothing for national okay. points. Yeah, that that would bother me because yeah, I mean you're 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 gaming the system for sure, and uh, that would bother me as a fan because um, then yeah, then you have the fast guy starting up front, and then they pull out to a big lead, you know, in a in a future week and and stink up the show as you stated. So yeah, that that would bother me as a fan. And I just want to touch on your, you know, changing tires, you know, if it's on the first lap or whatever. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, I mean, yeah, if you were involved in a wreck um, or uh, got a flat tire, you would try to fix it and get back out there. And now, you know, now if you're running in the back and your car's not handling, you know, people just pull in. But uh, I mean, when I was on MJ's crew, that was one of my responsibilities was to get get all the pit lane stuff ready. So I. I would assemble all, everything that we that you would think that you would need on pit lane if if you had to change a tire or fix your car if you were in an accident. So two things, Carlos. Maybe you can write this down. Maybe you can remember it. But two things that can that that can help this is just go to the top two. Just invert the top two. You don't need to invert three. You don't need to invert half the field. If you invert the top two only, now heat races matter again because right now. You get you get two heats. The top four go in, right? We'll use Watertown as an example. They had, I think, 10 mods or 11 mods. Well, you get a DNF in there. You got five cars. You got to beat one guy. You're in the invert. Well, that's stupid. Like, you don't even race. I mean, the people that want to race, race. But for the end, there's, it doesn't mean anything. But if you got to get up into the top two to invert and start in the front couple rows, you're going to try harder. The rate, the heat races are going to matter. It's going to be more entertaining throughout the board. So just go to the top two. That'll help a lot. The other thing is reward people. I believe, I believe USRA does this, that you get one point per car passed. So every car that you pass, if you start, um, 10th in the feature and you win from 10th it's easy to put into the formula award drivers for starting deeper and and moving forward so that's that's an alternative in there but they're inverting way too many you don't really need to invert that many it's it's just not good so hopefully uh hopefully that gets addressed so mark had one here buddy mine mark from back in uh back in the day boone speedway iowa they did something interesting. Sounds like they've been doing this for a while. They guys, they have something called the Hawkeye challenge. And uh, when I first saw this, I kind of blew it off. I'm like, well, that's a little freaking stupid, right? They literally ran four three Oh five sprints, four modifieds, four mod lights, four sportsmen, four stock cars, and four hobby stocks in one race against each other, all on the track at the same time. I don't know what it paid or whatever, but, they also have a breakdown in there. So in order to win whatever class you're in, you the first driver to compete the allotted laps for that class wins. It's over. So the 305 sprints had to run 25 laps. IMCA mods had to run 23, so on and so forth down the line. Kind of a neat deal. IMCA TV had a little deal, a clip of it on their Facebook page. I watched it, and the drivers all loved it. The fans loved it. They thought it was kind of unique, different, exciting. That, you know, kind of Bert, you kind of mentioned, eh, maybe I don't know if I'm really keen on it for some different reasons, but different. It's unique. It's different. Good, bad, and different. What What do you got? What's your thoughts on that deal they did at Boone with the Hawkeye Challenge? Well, when I watched it, I mean, it was fun to watch. I mean, watching the sprint car slice and dice through the traffic because it was so much faster than the other cars. But like I stated um, on Facebook, I would just a little concerned about, uh, you know, if there was a wreck, um, 
I know all the drivers wear the same safety equipment and stuff, but, uh, but the cars don't weigh the same. I mean, if you get a, a stock car plowing into one of those mini, mo those mod lights, uh, you know, they could do some damage or, you know, a sprint car hitting one of those mini lights at full speed, you know, that, that, that's my concern, just the liability. That's what makes it exciting. <laughs> if you die, you die, right? It just, <laughs> Kraus, your thoughts. You think that's something you could pull off at Viking? I mean, you think that's something the crowd will get into or what? Well, you'd have to go more than four class, four cars per class at Viking because you wouldn't have too many cars on the track and on the big half mile. But I, you, you hit it, you hit it, Ryan. It, it's different. You know what I mean? And I think this day and age, the same old, same old is kind of getting same old, same old. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I know Superior does the the B mods and the super stock deal up there head to head, which, you know, I think fans can be torn between that. It'd be different if you, and obviously the modifieds can't keep up with the late models. So we have a hard time with, with that. So um, uh, it, it's different. I, I was amused watching it. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, from a driver, I, you know, I, it'd be fun. I think if you're in it, there'd be no doubt about it. It'd be something different. You'd have to be really aware of your surroundings. Like Bert said, what's going on, but just different. Boone can get away with it. It's Boone. You know what I mean? It, it's, uh, you know, you do that up around here somewhere, and people would be like, what are you guys doing? You know what I mean? So Boone's a completely different playground down there. IMC did a great job of that. Great promo video. Great, you know, promoting that. Give some people to see different classes and stuff like that. So I think that the correct response is different. Um, and it would, like I said, it was fun, and Boone can get away with it. Yeah. Do you guys know what an Australian pursuit race is? I do. I do. Okay. They, I mean, they did that. In, they did that in Hibbing way back when my dad was still racing. Well, but go ahead and explain it. Yeah. I mean, back in the early 2000s, uh, Shano's Speedway would do that. I don't know, maybe a couple times a year. They haven't done it for probably at least 10 years. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. You start off with, you know, whatever number of cars, eight, nine, 10 cars, and you line them up single file, you start single file. And if you get passed by a car that starts behind you, then you have to pull off the track because you're done. So you race so many laps or until there's only one car left. Yeah, it, that was pretty a uh, pretty unique deal too. And, and that was pretty fun to watch because it, it, you had to work for it. There had to be passing done. And that's what people want to watch. They don't want to see the, you know, that's where you can do the gimmicky. Hey, let's put our fast guy in the back. You can do that shit like that. You don't need to put the fast guy in the back in every single freaking race, but on stuff like that, I think it's kind of neat. All right. Thanks, Mark, for that one. Central Minnesota racer. A little bit of a, in fact, it says signed old cranky racer. Why do all these tracks in my area got to bow down to FYE and cancel every time they have a special? He goes, F that, the guy running FYE, not everything's been all peaches and roses. You know, he's, a lot of issues. Kicked off the Wissota board, DTRA failed, Casson shut down. I mean, he's got a whole long list of stuff here, right? He goes, there's classes at Princeton and Ogilvy that have raced two times this year, and because of all the specials and nights off and all that, they literally only have five shows left. This weekend, there's nowhere to race. I was talking to a guy, you know, Central Minnesota. He's like, well, shit, there ain't nowhere to go. If I want to race, I have to go to Superior, and I like Superior. Don't get me wrong, but that's the only option. There's I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, seems like every freaking week it's like, okay, we're going to have a special. Everybody cancel their stuff. He goes, is this, is this getting old? Should, should racetracks continue to cancel every single weekend that there's a special, your, your thoughts on this? I mean, my opinion is, I mean, there comes a point where how many times do you cancel a weekly program? I mean, we're kind of, I mean, I don't want to get off the topic that you guys are discussing, but we're kind of uh, going through the opposite thing in, in eastern Wisconsin, where tracks are just scheduling over the top of each other. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the opposite problem because then you're, you know, you're splitting up cars and, and whatnot. So um, I don't know what the answer is, but I mean, either there should be a limit on the number of specials that you can have and, you know, in which tracks cancel or tracks should be i mean are these tracks not allowed or they're just deciding not to race against them 
they're, they're deciding not to because they okay. know a lot of their drive. And, and it's kind of a double edged sword. It's, I don't know. It's not really Fourth of July weekend. That's next weekend, right? So I don't, I don't understand why so many tracks are taken off this coming weekend because the Fourth of July weekend is Fourth of July is on Thursday, the following week. So I don't know. So there's so many. There's a bunch of tracks taken this weekend off, and and it's especially it's more frustrating this year because there's been so many freaking rainouts. So you take the rain oats and compound it with all that. And I, and I get it. You build a race car. You want to be able to race it and your home tracks are canceling. That's not well, cool. I get it. If the home tracks are still allowed to race, um, I think the home track has to know, know the pulse of their drivers and know how many of their drivers would actually go to the special. And if the majority of the drivers aren't going to go to the special anyway, just let them race at their home track. Yeah, that's, that, my, that's my opinion. I, I agree, Bert Kraus. I one hundred percent agree, Bert. Here's the the big issue is Ryan. It's the fans. The fans aren't showing up for a weekly show for some reason this year. I don't know what's going on. You have a special, the fans come out, and you have a normal race night, the fans aren't coming out. So this is one hundred based off promoters and fans. It's not cars. Cars are going to show up. You know, like Viking, our car counts up this year. Um, but for our specials, our fans have been good. Our normal night, our fans haven't been very good. And the weather has something to do with that, too. Fans wake up in the morning, it's cloudy, and they ain't going to sit outside. The race is going to rain, and then you got to deal with the rain check and all this and that. So um, drivers are drivers. We're going to show up. We're going to race. Um, you know, here at Viking, you know, I we, we just had this discussion last night. We got the UMSS Sprint Cars coming up. Um, they're bringing two classes. I got five classes. Do I really want to run seven classes in one night? No. But like Bert said, now all of a sudden I I drop a couple classes. Now you take away a night from them. It's 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 a nightmare. Um, but the big thing is it's the fans, Bert. For some reason, Ryan, I, I some reason there's so many specials. That's all fans are picking and choosing to go to. Wow. I'm gonna go to special here. I'm gonna go to a special. Why would I go to a regular race night when I can go to a special? Monty's got one. I ninety four's got World Outlaws this weekend. We got UMSS Sprint cars in two weekends. Ogilvy's got a special every single week. You know what I mean? So I, I wow. really think it's coming down to a fan deal. Um, fans are only going to the specials just because they're special. Well, because they're special, and also because the economy. I mean, everything is just more expensive than it has been in past years. So it's like, okay, I can go to a weekly show, but then I can't go to the special. But if I save up my money, then I can go, go to the special and see the best of the best race against each other. We all love racing, but sometimes less is more, right? It's a supply and demand thing. It's just like economics. And right now there's a mass surplus of racing. I mean, as a fan with streaming and all that, you can watch racing every single night, all at all, every single night. So people are not only it's the specials. A lot of people are going, well, shit, I don't know, I'll go to a regular night race here, or I could sit home barbecue and watch world of outlaws, Lucas oil, USMTS. I can watch that all online. So I get it. It's a slippery <laughs> slope, but I get it as a racer too. I mean, you, you got to have enough shows for your grassroots guys to race and gals to race or they're not going to race anymore and you're not going to have a future. So that's a slippery slope. South Dakota race fan, your thoughts on the Tyler Peterson, Jason, good deal at casino. Little backstory there, late model battling for the lead Two very good drivers. TPO, of course, the reigning champ, Jason, good second year guy. I think he won a few last year battling for the lead and good ends up facing the wrong way. Yellow comes out. TPO gets a call. He says, screw it, pulls off the track. I did watch the video. I have my thoughts. I mean, I think it was probably a, the wrong call. Um, did you guys get a chance to see that? Did you watch that? Race? I did not. Cross, uh, what, what was your thoughts on that deal? Yeah, I was actually, I was watching it. I wasn't there, but I was watching it live. And so I actually, I don't know what else I was watching. I looked up and TPO was pulling off the track. I'm like, wait a minute here. What's going on? They were just battling side by side. Um, and I missed the part where they swapped because TPO was on the outside and then Good slid him back and then TPO got to the bottom. Brian, they ran two to th actually more than that. It was six to seven laps side by side and they weren't touching TPO. They did swap, you know, a little bit of a, not a slide job. You couldn't really slide job them because the track was slick. I thought they did a really good job of not hitting each other, of giving each other room, both of them. Um, and 
100% a racing incident. I saw it. Um, and who knows, like you said, he, you know, good got hit, spun out down the track. Now a call has to be made. Uh, we all know who's running the track out in casino. Um, it's a super tough call. It's a super tough thing to do. Um, but obviously they put the call on TPO. Uh, I, <laughs> I've seen it, Ryan. I've seen it both ways. I've seen both guys, drivers sent to the back. I've seen drivers both get their spot back on incidents is that they've given them their, you know what I mean? I don't know what you do with rules of rules. Someone has to get the call. TPO got the short end of the stick. Um, he's going to get more calls and he's not it's just the way it is. Tough call, tough racing deal. I didn't think anything intentional. Um, obviously, like I said, when Jason Good's involved in what track you're at, you're going to get some keyboard warriors pumping away on the keyboard. Yeah, there's always speculation that, oh, it's favoritism. Well, I do know somebody that knows the official pretty well that made the call. And he's like, easiest call I ever made. It was the right call. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it was, one, it was 100% the right call. Well, then he watched the video, and he's like, um, maybe not. Maybe that was the wrong call. And uh, so constructive criticism on this, I guess, would be, well, I'll be casinos. Go ahead, Bert. Well, I was just going to say, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, uh, you know, these officials, they have to make that call in a split second. You know, we get to watch the replay and watch it again and put it in slow motion if we want to, uh, where they have to make the call just right split second. <laughs> so I can see where he thought, yeah, I, I saw it as plain as day. But then when you see the, the replay, oh, OK, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> I watched it a bunch of times on my phone and I'm like, I got to blow this up because I can't, I mean, it, it was, it was hard to see on the phone. Like, I'm like, I don't really know what I'm seeing here. And if I, if to me, right, this is why I've been saying this for a while. Casino is the smallest track in Wasota. When you're standing in the infield and something happens, it's bam instantly. Well, it's 10 times more instantly there. Cause it's so small. I've, if I said it once, I said it a thousand times. I want to see a racetrack make the decision to take their corner officials out of the corner and put them up in the booth and give them a different vantage point or maybe just get a couple more people in there for a night. Maybe not to overrule the cars, but just to be like, okay, we're going to sit up here and we're going to watch the corners, keep our corner workers down there, and let's see if we have the same opinion on incidents that happen. Because I feel like if they're sitting in a different spot, a bird's eye view, they're going to be able to make better calls, but yeah, I, I don't think there was necessarily favoritism. I do think it was a wrong call. Um, tough break for Tyler Peterson, but um, yeah, I think uh, I'd like to see a track put their corner workers in a different spot. The last one I have, and boy, we had, thanks a lot fans for sending. We had a lot of stuff this week. This one here comes from a uh, late model fan. It just says, so Jeff Smith won the hunt the front late model race this past week. And we didn't talk much about them, but is he the most under the radar regional open late model guy that's a second generation driver to a Hall of Famer that literally never gets talked about? So, for those that don't know, Jeff Smith is the son of uh, Hall of Famer Freddie Smith, uh, the late Freddie Smith. And that's a guy, I mean, we never hear about him. The guy I look at is my race pass as a staff. He wins a bunch of races regionally. The dude's a good race car driver. But is how crazy is it that we never hear about Jeff Smith? I mean, almost never hear about this guy. Is that is that interesting to you guys? Yeah, I mean, I saw an article about him in one of the racing magazines, I don't know, several years ago. Uh, but yeah, to be honest with you, I didn't even realize he was still racing. You know, I just <laughs> never, you just don't hear his name. Yeah, and you it's don't. Probably because he doesn't, he must not travel at all. I mean, he just stays in his, his region. And I mean, some of the regional racers, you know, well, just take, uh, uh, Josh Rice, for example, you know, he, he's a very good racer in his region, but he does travel a little bit, you know, to other areas. So his name is a, is a little bit more recognizable because of that. And it probably helps that his races like at Florence were on flow. Yeah, right? and we all have flow, so we see them. Those those races down there are typically streamed on something different that we don't maybe all all have. So, 
All right, let's jump into a little who's hot and who's not brought to you by our friends at Daytona One Performance Lubricants. So a lot of great products. I mean, lubricants is a key to longevity and performance in everything. Engines, gears, transmission, power steering, right? Greases, engine lubes, you name it. But one thing that they're super fond of is their tire treatments. And why? Because they want tires to last longer. They want people to, they don't want people to be one and done with tires. So they have some great stuff out there. They have a cleaner and they have several different grades of treatment that'll allow you to take a used tire and get more life out of it. Now there's people using this stuff all over the country. Now let's be honest in with soda, the tire treatment's not legal, but guess what? People have been putting stuff on their tires as long as there's been tires, right? It just is, is what it is. Some trying to get an advantage. Everybody trying to get an advantage, right? Let's just face it. But this product here is not just to get an advantage, but to get more life out of your tires, to make you run your tires longer. It's legal, like in the Gen X late model series, it's legal there. But if you're a driver right now and you're looking at it, it's like, I can't put new tires on every night. I just can't do it, right? Can't do it. Not not interested, can't do it. Well, this might be an option for you, right? Just keep your mouth shut and do your thing and live with the consequences if you get nabbed because it is what it is. But the fact of the matter is it's out there. People are using it. They're having success. They're winning races. It's a good product. The founder of this company in the hall of fame for his lubricants. And uh, Krauss, I know you're going to a meeting here this week. You're going down to the, the tech meeting for Wasota. They're talking about tires. I saw Bert press release, come, not press release, but a uh, email comes out to the track, all the tracks here in the last couple of days. I had, Multiple different tracks send me this, by the way. So, and uh, they basically said that. Uh, remember, remember we talked about on the show that hey, they're uh, the bids came back. American Racer came in cheaper, and they came in. They're going to do more for Wasota, and they said, hey, we're going to make Hoosier requote this deal because this is ridiculous. And they raised the tires nine percent, thinking, oh, they're going to give everybody a good deal when the contract's up. Well, that's bullshit, right? Well, guess what? It said right in that thing, they're not testing any other tires. They are basically made the decision that they're going to go with Hoosier. Now they're just working on the contract. And Shannon at Hoosier basically told them that tires are going up, boys. Tires are going up. It just is what it is. If we have a, and, and the wording was, if we have a short contract, a short contract, they're going way up quick, fast, and in a hurry. If we spread that contract out over a long period of time, we can take that increase and we can incrementally spread that out over time to get to where we want to be. So essentially what's happening is Hoosier Tire and Wasota are hawk-tooing on that thing and they're going to stick it up the <laughs> ass of every Wasota racer. So it just is what it is. This product right here should be legal. It's not right now. should be, right? If this product does what it does and I talk to drivers that use it, I know people using this tires or on their tires and they said, look, we're getting more life out of them. We are able to run these tires longer. Do you want to spend $180, $190 on a tire? Do you want to do that for $300 to win? Nope. So this right here might be a great alternative. Give Chad a call, 507-828-3536. Get informed. And I, I urge track promoters to do the same thing. If you're a track promoter listening to this, you call Chad. You get educated. Don't take the words from me. This ain't just a softener type deal. This is a treatment. Get educated on the facts because overinflated prices on tires is going to kill the sport. This here could be a solution to help the longevity of racing. All right, boys. Who's hot? Bert, we'll start with you. Who's hot? All right. Before I get into who's hot, I just want to say what you just described about with soda and hoosier sounds like an episode of the sopranos <laughs> <laughs> it might be when it's all said and done but just say that it's <laughs> that you never know what might happen it's 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 brutal for sure all right i'm going to take the low-hanging fruit just because uh there's actually some things to talk about regarding this but i'll i'll take uh, rtj um you know another big victory for him on the lucas series i mean hit him winning well, he won by 12 seconds, and uh, not only is he winning, but he's uh, he's uh, um, kicking kicking ass. <laughs> and uh, the other drivers are taking notice, and they're not happy. And actually, 
uh, coach, I did, I did read that article that you were the one that shared that article, weren't you? I did read that. And, uh, I mean, Marler basically said that he needs an engineer on his pit crew, uh, because it's just him and his buddies. And basically they're not smart enough to, you know, they don't have the engineering experience that, um, that, uh, RTJ crew guy has, has on for RTJ. And then he also mentioned Devin Moran too, must have a crew guy. That's got a pretty good engineering background. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. I mean, let's face it. I mean, there's Jonathan Davenport. I mean, not that he's not fast, but his crew guy left, his crew chief left, and he got slower, right? So there is something to be said for having a pretty sharp guy in your corner. Who else you got uh, on the hot list? Um, That's the only one that I had. Coach, who's hot? <laughs> um, The only, the only, I got one tidbit, Ryan. Another hundred lap news fest feature. When are they going to figure out we don't need a hundred laps? We do not need a hundred laps in these races, people. We don't need to see it. Get rid of it. I don't want to see another hundred lap race. That's all I got to say about that. Uh, Amen. Who's hot? We got to go with Tyler Courtney. Um, just looking up his stats, Ryan Burt and Ryan. He's got thirty seven races this year, thirty two top tens. And he's running high limits, world outlaws. And, you know, you say what you want about the IRA. Too. There's some Jacob Allen ran all weekend, Emerson Axum, Noah Gass. There were some guys that ran that series. So I got to go with Tyler Courtney. Um, one at Houston's, won two in a row on the IRA deal. Was probably a contender to win big money at Houston's if it went to flood it out. So uh, got to go hot with him. Um, national was sold at level. Um, I got to give a shout out to Wasota, Wasota Hornet driver, Ryan, uh, Cole Campson currently leading the national points. Just looked up his stats, 18 starts, 17 top fives. His worst finish this year is six. Um, he's consistent. Um, he's a good kid. Um, helped me out a lot. He was really, you know, about, we switched obviously to Wasota Hornets this year from short tracker. So did I 94. It's obviously benefiting him. He's leading the national points. He's a consistent young kid. And he's one of these couple weeks ago, he was coming to me, Ryan. He was, these guys are cheating. These guys are cheating. I go, Cole, worry about yourself. Get yourself faster. Don't worry about those guys. You get yourself faster. If you're legal, do it the right way. And he's been doing that. So I got to give a shout out to Cole Camps and uh, Wasota Hornet driver, who's uh, pretty hot right now. boy, Good job, Cole. Keep up the good work. National level, Devin Moran. So RTJ is easy, low lying fruit for sure. He's been he's been on fire. I mean, uh, without question, Devin Moran though traditionally has been the guy that is really fast at speed weeks. And then where the hell did he go the rest of the year? Right, and all of a sudden he kind of flashes in. Devin Moran has been in the conversation all year long. He's he's solidly in the final four right now for the Lucas points. Pretty cool, too, guys. He's actually making the trek north. He's coming to Minnesota. He's going to race uh, the I-94 Ada Grand Forks swing and the three XR races. So pretty cool to see Devin Moran making the trip up. But Devin Moran been really good. On, on the Wissota level, the nightmare, Lucas Rodin. Um, a pair of wins this weekend in the Rebel Midwest Mod Tour. And he locked up another championship. I think he won at the. Did he has he won every one? I think he might have won. Is he? Is there been another champion in the Rebel Series other than him? Like he seems to pretty much dominate that. But I tell you what, when the money's on the line, you can't bet against him. Lucas Rodin's a race car driver. I figured I was going to try to get cute and creative. It worked out well for me one night because I did pick Lance Shell. He won at uh, Grand Forks. But I picked Mike Nichols. I'm like, Mike Nichols, it's Watertown. He's the guy. Lucas Rodin drove by him. They, that was a hell of a race. Scott Vince was on the bottom, Nichols on the top, and Rodin drove right through the middle. I'm like, that was a good racetrack. That's a hats off to the racetrack at Casino. But Lucas Rodin been on fire. And then my, I guess my new local area, Illinois. This one's going to piss off the fucking race camp right here, boys. Zuby, Zach Zuberbreyer. 
That is the competition, the number one competition for the one to go show 83. And uh, old Dave's been seeing his back bumper quite a bit this year. Zuby's got five wins on the year and eight starts. He won three of the last four, um, two nights in a row now. I think that he won at Sycamore and Dave got second behind him. That's coming to an end. But I'm telling you right now, Zuby on the hot list. Let's let's do something about that. It's kind of pissing me off, but it is what it is. Dave, get it together. All right, Bert, who's not? Um, I don't have his finishes in front of me, but I'm going to go with Shannon Babb just from the fact that you know you expect to see him on the Hell Tour races, and he didn't go to a bunch of them, and um, you know. What, the ones he has been at, uh, well, he did finish ahead of figure that one time, and I lost my <laughs> my bold prediction because of that. <laughs> but I, I'll go with him. Anybody locally? I mean, there's no racing, but you got anybody locally? We haven't had it? any racing for, for like two or three weeks, um, so I'm going to go Mother Nature. <laughs> Fair enough. Coach Krause, who's not? Uh, well, he was um, – I'm still going to do it. and I know all you Bobby Pierce lovers out there. Okay, but Bobby Pierce up until last night, and I know you're wearing his hat, Ryan. Okay, he had nine wins before April 13th. Okay, now he's sitting at 12. You throw out last night, he had two wins from mid-April to the end of June. Okay, two wins. All right, and I don't know. Did it have something to do with the dope and tire deal? I don't know. There's a lot of speculation out there that's going on. He gets busted for dope and tires. Hasn't been. It was obviously pretty good last night. Track position was the was the key new last car. night. But you know, new, new car. car every, you know, everybody's saying how hot Bobby Pierce is. He's he's he needs to win. Okay, Bobby Pierce isn't a podium guy. He's not a top five guy. He's a, I got to win guy. He's, since April, it was mind boggling when I looked it up. I was just went looking through the points, say who's who's not hot. I, it's Bobby Pierce up until last night. Was, was, wins last night. You know, we'll see. I think he. Uh, I think he just won his heat tonight, too, I was watching. So, um, you know, be interesting to see how he does this weekend. I think he's going to do good on these tracks, a little bit different dirt. I think these tracks up in this area suit him well, so hopefully he can get back on the hot hot streak. Um, who's not hot? Shane Edgington, Ryan. I, I think you may have said something about him earlier. Um, he's Canadian. I, I know he's. I know he <laughs> likes to play hockey. Um 15 starts, no wins. Only only six top fives, Ryan. Um, struggled at Cedar Lake. I think he won. Did he not win a feature there last year at the at the uh at the Masters? Um, you know, hasn't been very good. He's got a couple seconds here and there. Um, you know, does he run against some strong competition? I think the Dakotas are. I really do, especially Grand Forks and Fergus. There's some tough late models there, but um, you know. He just has. If you think Shane Edgington, you think he's going to probably get a win at Grand Forks. He's going to come down nine ninety four and get a win, or he's going to go over to Grand and get a win. So uh, hopefully uh, we can get him, get him going, and get him up on the podium. Yeah, that's a good one. I didn't even think about him. I'm going to go Dennis Herb Jr. in the late models. I mean, flat out irrelevant. He wins a World of Outlaw title a couple of years ago, and he has literally. And, and let's face it, it is what it is. The level of competition that year was down, right? I mean, it was watered down that year. But he has been, last year, or last night, he kind of cost Hoffman a win because he's all over the racetrack. He's on bottom, top, middle. I mean, it's like, that's not Dennis Herb Jr. He is on the struggle bus in 28 and has just been a complete non-factor. Locally, Tristan Labarge, a guy that literally, I, I think at one point last year, he won like seven, eight features in a row. And he has two wins on the year, but ninth on Proctor on Sunday and you know I don't know it, it just that 19 not looking really good he's working on it trying to get some shit better not where the, where he wants to be but he's on the not hot list right now and of course uh 29 star I mean and you've got one finish in the year we've got to keep you on there it just is what it is <laughs> and uh even though he's got second last night pretty good run that's not what he's that after last year he's not about second I got to put Dave Dulciak on there too. So you and both one to go show uh, cars on the not hot list. Any additional shout outs or any mentions here before we get into our predictions and pick them segments, anything that you, uh, that needs shout out or anything that you want to, any 
thing that needs to be brought up before we jump move on? Bert? Um, I I have a couple of things. Uh, did you see? Uh, I mean, a few weeks ago we had the the complete body fall off of that one street stock car. Did you see the entire deck fall off? Of, was it McLaughlin's uh, car? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, I have never seen deck panels just flapping in the wind like like sails. <laughs> Hit the here's, pace car, guy. Th- Hit the pace theory, car. Bert. Here's my what? theory. These chassis manufacturers are doing it on purpose. Okay. These people don't have time to make their own bodies and stuff anymore. Let's just wire tie them on because that's what they're doing. Okay. <laughs> I've been racing for a lot of years, Bert, and I I lost one nose piece in Watertown on my street stock. I lost my whole nose piece. That's the first time in 27 years I've ever lost a body panel in my car. We're talking whole deck pieces, the whole deck, spoilers, both quarter panels and sail panels. I, I'm telling you right now, these chassis builders are doing it on purpose because they know they're just going to drop their car off. Aluminum's high priced right now. Labor's 100 and some dollars an hour. They can charge these people, whatever. They're doing it on purpose. Bert, what's he st- what's astonishing about the fact that he hasn't had a body fall off? You've seen him drive that he hits everything. <laughs> like literally, 20, he hits everything. And the body if, if the body didn't fall off his car back then, it shouldn't fall off anybody's car now. I'm just saying, <laughs> right? All right. All right. So all right. Um Carlos, that, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Well, I'm gonna give out a couple of donkey awards. I don't oh, give out many. Boy. Hold on. <laughs> I'm j- out. What do we got? Well, you guys may disagree with me, but I- um, well, the Dirt Kings race, they were supposed to race at 141 this last weekend. Obviously, uh, it got rained out and uh, they rescheduled it and they rescheduled it against the USA Nationals, which, <laughs> yes, 141 is three to four hours away from Cedar Lake. So whatever. But the USA Nationals is like the like, I mean. It's like a special weekend in Wisconsin for late model racing. Why would, especially this series, I mean, Nick Avalink has been going there for the last 20 years to race. He's the point leader in the division. I mean, you can't make decisions just based on one driver, but based on for the Masters, there's like eight different Eastern Wisconsin late models at Cedar Lake. So I was expecting there'd be probably three to five, maybe. Now I don't know how many will go there. But, I mean, even drivers who don't race go to Cedar Lake the race, they go there just to watch. Um, And there's a lot of fans from eastern Wisconsin who go to Cedar Lake to watch the USA Nationals. And, you know, this is the series that schedules over the top of weekly racing to make their their drivers drive to Iowa. And then when some of their drivers want to go race at the USA nationals, they schedule a dirt Kings race. It just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> well, Bert, you said they can't make a decision based on one driver. Well, shit, they only have four, right. That have made all the shows. Well, so they kind of, they kind of have to make weekend, a decision. They'll, they'll probably have three because I, I'm, uh, I would imagine Nick's going to go to the USA nationals. As, as tough as scheduling is, I get it. I get it. Scheduling is tough, but come on. Let's have some common sense here. I mean, at, at some point, you just got to look at it and say, look, hey, we tried. We wanted to get it in. There ain't an available date. Let's cancel it. Move on to next year. I mean, I get it. They want to have a late model show there, but yeah, Bert, you're spot on. That's a, that's a big hit because there's a lot of them guys who go to Cedar Lake. USA National is a big deal. Has been for a long time. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else? Um, just, uh, this coming weekend is racing for a reason, uh, at Shano Speedway. So that's always a big weekend there. Uh, a lot of, uh, bucket raffles racing, raising money to fight childhood cancer. Awesome. You making a die cast for that again? Yes, I am making a die cast. Um, I'm a little behind schedule. This is what I have so far. It's, I got to do some painting. I have the decals though. So I just need to paint it and put the decals on. You got a little work to do. You'll get her done. You'll be last minute. Like I'll get it done. You'll, we'll be, he'll be putting the, putting the decals on as you get to the racetrack. I've done that. Just, before. Just, like, just like a real racer. Exactly. Coach Krause, any final shout outs or any, uh, anything else that you want to touch on before we move on? Uh, just central Minnesota fans get on down to Napa of Alexandria and get your free tickets to this 
uh, races this weekend at Viking Speedway. So it's Napa Central Minnesota free grandstand. So um, he's a big supporter. He owns like 20, 30 Napas in Central Minnesota, sponsors a bunch of tracks. So get down, support him, grab some tickets, get on out to Viking Speedway this weekend. Awesome. And uh, late model fans uh, in the area. So coming up, I guess the first, second, and third XR Super Series coming to town. Of course, World of Outlaws is going to be out in western Minnesota and North Dakota, but kind of cool. One of my favorite tracks as a racer and as a fan, Proctor Speedway. They are going to get start off that three-night swing. Proctor, the Gondekloss Speedway in Superior on Tuesday, and then Wednesday at Ogilvy for fifty grand. Those should be some really good races. And then with Soda Late Model Drivers, July 11th and 12th, Thursday and Friday, that Friday, the Tommy Wazaleski Memorial at the Hibbing Raceway, 11111 to win, 501 to start. That is big money. The night before that, the prelude to the Tommy, 3000 to win, $250 to start. Really good doubleheader. So if you're a Wasota Late Model guy, I would love to see the drivers um, go up there because there's a lot of money on the line. Love to see the fans come out. Also, in case we talked about, about the Hell Tour already, Lucas Rodin, um, I want to give a shout out Joey Jensen. Uh, Joey's a guy who really hasn't raced a lot in the last couple of years, but he's kind of taken that 30 kind of on tour in the B mod. Super stock as well, but that Midwest mod is rolling right now. I mean, I think he's got six or seven wins. He went up. He's got a win up in Grand Rapids. He won at Proctor. Super cool seeing Joey Jensen back traveling a little bit. Um, Big Sky Speedway had, they started the first two nights of the Mountain States Mod Tour. Midwest Mods, uh, they have a six-night series. I don't know if you guys saw, but Casper, Wyoming, kind of a secluded area, not quite getting the cars. Not quite getting the fan count, so they're uh, they dropped off that tour. So now it's two races at Big Sky, two races at Sheridan. But Troy Liker and Jeremy Mirhofer won night one and night number two. Now keep in mind this coming weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday on Dirt Race Central Sheridan Speedway, ten thousand dollars to win for the Midwest Mods. These cats, this is kind of their home stomping grounds. Some of our top guys heading over there. I know Blake Adams. I believe Nichols, I know Rodine, I believe, is heading over that way. Is it going to be one of the Eastern guys going over there taking the money, or is it going to be a Liker boy? Bart Taylor, a guy to keep an eye on. Jeremy Mirhofer, going to be some really good Midwest mod racing over there. And uh, USMTS wins Jake O'Neill, Tyler Wolf. Um, Minnesota right now leading the points in the USMTS with Jake Tim. All right, boys, 2024 weekly Pickums contest. And, uh, well, we do this every week. We take highlighted shows that, that typically us in the texting group that we're going to watch regional stuff that are specials, national races. And this segment's sponsored by Brad Parsons Soil and Egg Solutions. So if you're a farmer, if you're not completely underwater, right, and you want to you want to get higher yields, more profitability, you need to have the right stuff in your spray packages. Well, give Brad a call, 320-219-3542, and learn about the products that he has then that can make your farming experience better, make you more profitable, and uh, he's the guy to call helping racers. Um, he's a racer, wants to help more racers, people in the racing community. Also, Brad kicked in some money, as did I, as did uh, Worker Me, threw in some money as well. The winner of our pickums at the end is going to get to pick a driver that we're going to sponsor in 2025 so the one to go show going to give some money back to some racers pretty cool deal last week good old dano plus 15 boys dano plus 15 okay the next highest point total last week was eight he about doubled everybody up i don't know if he like somehow got curtis's picks sent them in and mistake i don't know maybe jeff screwed up and put the wrong name i don't really know what happened but plus eight or plus 15 Changa, Rain Man, and Bert, plus eight. 71A here, and Man Bun Dan, plus seven. The Uper, plus six. Beefcake and Worker B, plus five. Coach, you and Bromance, plus three. Kind of down in the cellar. Struggling there. Not hot list. Doesn't just apply to the race car, <laughs> but it applies to your picks as well. Okay, not hot list there. All right, so our standings right now. Rain Man, Curtis, our reigning champ, is Kind of giving us an ass kick, and he's RTJing us right now. He's at 185, Changa at 166. 
I'm at 146 and third. Daniel with a big week jumped up to fourth. He's at 141. Bert at 134. That rounds out the top five. Worker B, 133. Coach, you and Youper, the two Jeffs at 126. Beefcake, 123. Bromance, 115. And Man Bun Dan at 111. So this week, boys, we here's the races we're picking. I'll name off the races. You say who you guys have this week. World of Outlaw Late Models, five nights five nights of action. Of course, last night already happened, but Independence Speedway in Independence, Iowa was Monday. Tuesday at Webster City, that's going on as we speak right now. And then Thursday, the I-94 Speedway in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Friday, the River City Speedway in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And a new stop on the, on the tour here. Saturday, a track that me and Krauss made a lot of laps at, the Norman County Raceway, Ada, Minnesota. All right, guys, who do you have for the World of Outlaw Late Models? Bert, you go first. Uh, last night I had Pierce. Uh, tonight I have Huffman. And then next three nights, uh, Pierce, Gustin, Huffman. Okay. Coach? <laughs> I had Gustin last night. <clears throat> Got a flat. Hoffman tonight, he got about six in his heat, so he's going to be struggling. I got B. Shep and Fergus, Pierce at River Cities, and B. Shep at Norman County Raceway. All right. I had uh, the thrill from Mooresville, Nick Hoffman, last night. Of course, Bobby Pierce won, so all the Pierce pickers got the point there. Webster City tonight, I have Bobby Pierce. I-94, I have Devin Moran. River Cities. I have Bobby Pierce and Norman County Raceway, Devin Moran. World of Outlaw Sprint Cars at the Cedar Lake Speedway, Friday and Saturday doubleheader. Bert, what say you? Uh, Hot and Child Friday night and Gravel Saturday night. Coach? You're the man, Bert. I got the exact same thing. <laughs> I went with the daily double. I got David Sand and Gravel times two. High limit sprint cars, Lake Ozark on Wednesday, and then a double header at the Lucas Oil Speedway in Wheatland on Friday and Saturday. Bert. Uh, I have Sweet on Wednesday and then Courtney uh, the next two races. Coach. I got Kyle Larson on Wednesday and uh, Tyler Courtney Friday, Saturday. I went with uh, I, I went easy here. I did exactly what Krauss wants me to do, and I took Sunshine, Tyler, Courtney, all three nights. Volunteer 50, an unsanctioned late model race at Bulls Gap. Bulls Gap, Tennessee, Volunteer Speedway, 50 large to the winner down on the high banks. Bert, who do you got? RTJ. Coach? I'm going with Mike Marlar and his buddies. They're winning. <laughs> I went with the local guy, another local guy down there from uh, Tennessee. I went with the Mac Daddy, Dale McDowell. Summer showdown at Sheridan. $10,000 to win for the Midwest Mods. We're picking the finale on Saturday night. That'll be on Dirt Race Central, by the way. Bert, who do you got? How many leakers race Midwest Mods? Uh, there's two likers. There's Troy and for Tony likers. Liker. Yep. Okay, I wrote down Tony like her. Okay, okay. I got Coach, Tony as well. You know, I picked Tony last week. He kind of let me down. Um, kind of, I don't know what the hell the deal was there. So I, I went with the brother this time. See if I can maybe jinx him instead. I got Troy like her. I was thinking, you know, I, I just about put in Lucas Rodine, and I probably should have. Um but God dang, it's hard to beat them Likers. This is our home turf right here. So I got I got Troy Liker, and you got Tony. Both of you got Tony. Border Battle, FYE Border Battle at the Gondek Law Speedway, Superior, Wisconsin, Friday and Saturday. Night number one and night number two of the KME Late Model Series. They're doing a sweet-ass series uh, Joe put together. 7500 to win for late models. God, late model guys, got to support this. Got You got to you gotta be there. A lot of money on the line. So Friday and Saturday for the late models. And then Saturday, $10,000 to win the border battle for the modifieds. Bert, late models and mod. Who do you got? All right. It's turning the season around starting this weekend. Pat Doerr, both Friday and Saturday. 
And then uh, Sabraski and the Mods on Saturday. Pat Nord is really good at Superior. That's never a bad pick, for sure. Coach Krause, who do you got? Uh, Kevin Burdick on Friday, late model. I'm going to Shane Sabraski on Saturday in the late model. And then I'm going with Sabraski in the mod. Amy late models. I'm taking the Hermantown hammer, Daryl Nelson, both nights. And in the modifieds, I'm taking a guy that got disqualified last year for cheating because he's a fucking cheater. And that's what he does. <laughs> um, Johnny broken. Okay. So he got third last year, but I think his, his, his header broke like the, it actually broke. And then they DQ'd him because it was laying on the track and whatever rule. So he ended up getting DQ'd. So not a cheater. I'm just kidding. But uh, so he, he officially got 24th last year. This year he's going to get first. So Johnny Broking in the modified. And then last but not least, Thursday night, ABC Raceway in Ashland, Wisconsin. They're running a show called the Farm Stock Special, Midwest Mods, Super Stocks, and Modifieds. Bert. Uh, Midwest Mods, Joey Jensen, Supers, Taryn Spacek, and Modifieds, Nick Oreskovic. Okay, that'd be cool to see Nick O get her done. All right, Coach Krause, what do you got? Uh, Joey Jensen, B Mod, Taryn Spacek, Super. Um, going with my boy, uh, Brandon Kopp in the mods. All right, all right. Boy, uh, I guess Joey Jensen getting a little love here. He's fucked, by the way. If all three of us picked him, there's no <laughs> chance. No, Joey, we're sorry. You're screwed. You might as well stay home. Ain't going to happen, okay? I got Joey Jensen in the Midwest Mods also. I have Shane Kissling in the Super Stocks, and I have Mike Anderson in the Modifieds. All right. Bold prediction time, or sometimes Bert makes the prediction, and it's not so bold. <laughs> um, we start with an accountability session. We talk about the predictions we made and kind of keep track, but brought to you by Coach, uh, one of our sponsors, the editor of our show. Yes, elevate-visual.com video productions. Uh, make sure if you need any video work done, any drone work done, your realtor, um, you need drone work done, video of any sorts, Make sure you get a hold of Brandon at elevate-visual.com. You can also find him on Facebook. Yeah, Brandon does some great work. There's a lot of stuff for realtors. And I mean, he just he's kind of all over the place. So definitely check out his stuff. Thanks, Brandon, for what you do. So not a lot of not a lot of racing this past weekend. Um, so Bert, you and I had nothing come off the board this week. And I, I talked to our statistician, and he's going to take some time here over the next week or so. We still have some old old ones that maybe haven't been quite cleaned up yet that he's going to he's going to touch on. But uh, the Uper, he had a couple come off the board. The first one was the thrill from Mooresville. Nick Hoffman would have a better average finish in the three World of Outlaw late model races last weekend than Bobby Pierce. Well, Nick Hoffman got a seventh a sixth and a first pretty solid started out. Bobby Pierce got eighth on night one, but he got a second in a third and 4.3 average for Pierce 4.7 average for Hoffman. That is incorrect, sir. You did not get that correct. And uh, right here, he said that rain man would not have the most points. Now Curtis has been whooping the shit out of us in our, in our pickums. He said he would not have the most points. So he switched, I, I think is what happened. He switched the, the picks for Dano and Rain Man and gave all the points to Dano. And Dano gave everybody an ass whooping. So he did get that one correct. Probably pencil fucked everybody. I'm not sure. I didn't look very close. All right, Coach, you had two come off the board as well. You said the Rebel Midwest Mod Tour would see different winners each night this week. Lucas Rodine won night one and Ada. Lance Schill won night number two. Mother Nature won night number three. So far, you're right on the money. Mother Nature don't count, but Lucas Rodine doubled up. He won a casino. You got that one wrong. And then you said no Rockets would get podium finishes for the World of Outlaws or Lucas Oil races this weekend. And I'm assuming that does not count the prelims, or did that count the prelims? No. So how do you figure you fared on that one? I'm pretty sure I got that right, did I not? Brent Larson, 
Brad oh, Larson fucked you. Right. Of all people, Brad Larson <laughs> stole one from me. He was the lone rocket, the lone rocket on the podiums between the three World of Outlaw Nights and the Lucas Race, the B1 bomber denying Coach Krause. Denied. Good for him. All I'm right. happy for him. I'm glad he did it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Peanut gallery here. Beefcake had a couple come off the board. USMTS races would be won by different drivers each night. Initially, that was going to be four nights. It ended up only being two. He was correct. And then he said the world of outlaw late models would be swept. All three nights would be won by the same driver. And that did not happen. So we keep track of our correct predictions and we keep track of our percentage correct. And the Uper leading the way, 19 correct predictions. Guys, as a whole, we are absolutely terrible at this. We make three predictions every week. We're literally to the middle of the year, and the leader has 19 correct. We suck at this. We're terrible. Well, well and, that's why they're called bold predictions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some, Thanks, we gotta make, <laughs> They got to be bold, realistic, maybe. So <laughs> Peanut Gallery's got 13. Bert in the 29 star at 12. And I, I haven't even broke top 10. I haven't even broke 10 yet. I'm at nine. So evidently, my shit's bolder than yours because I don't get nothing right ever. Percentage correct. Uper's leading there, 32.8. Pretty comfortable margin over the Peanut Gallery. So uh, Bert's got the lowest prediction uh, percentage going on right now at 19.7. So, Bert, we're going to start with you. We're going to go to Coach Kraus, and then I got um, predictions here from the Uper, Worker B, Beefcake, and myself. We'll make uh, three laps around, and uh, they got to be racing related typically. So, Bert, what do you got? All right, Gondic Law Speedway, Friday, Saturday, late models. Uh, the podium drivers will be the same each night, but not necessarily in the same order. So, so the world be, of outlaw late huh? models? Wor no, superior superior. Oh, superior. So the KME, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So the KME late models, same podium finish drivers Friday and Saturday. If one rains out, is it just off the board then? They both have yeah. to obviously. Yeah. Okay. Ob yeah, because it dumb question. <laughs> dumb question. Donkey <laughs> award for that dumbass question. All right. So if both nights happen. Um, same podium drivers both nights. All right, coach, what do you got? Perfect, Bert. I'm going to lead into that, Bert, but I'm going to go opposite of you. I'm going to go six different drivers are going to podium uh, the KMEA late model deal. Um, so you're going to say the same three each night. I'm going six different drivers are going to podium. Okay. Okay. Completely different. All right. The Uper, his first one, NOS energy drink cars, meaning. Nick Hoffman, Sheldon Hoddenschild, and Sunshine Tyler Courtney. They will combine for four or more feature wins this week. So through, I don't think they race Sunday, through, through Saturday, they'll combine for four or more, which means that they will have won 45. So if there's rainouts in there combined, they will win 45% or more of the races those three drivers will combine for that. So 45% or more. All right. Worker B, he has one here. The smooth operator Bobby Pierce will go four of five. Will go four of five this week or win at least 80% of the races that happen this week in the world of outlaw late models. Four or five or 80% or better. Beefcake. Kind of goes with a different guy here. He's got Brandon Shepard will win three of five races this week, and he will podium every night this week. So he'll podium all five nights, and three of five will be in victory lane. My first one is going to be Lucas Oil Dirt Late Models. RTJ is going to have a point lead of 300 or more points going into the championship chase for the Lucas Oil deal at the end of the year. And for the second consecutive year, will not be crowned champion of the Lucas Oil Dirt Late Model Series. So he'll be awfully bummed out. All right, Bert, lap number two. 
Um, I'm going to go Eastern Wisconsin. Um, I'm not sure if he's racing Friday night, but I'm I'm gonna say that he is. I'm gonna say Troy Springborn wins two late model features this weekend. Troy Springborn gonna double up this weekend. All right, good luck, Troy. Good luck. Says, um, Friday night, Gravity Park is having a late model special. And Saturday is uh, Plymouth or Sean, Sean O'Connor. Plymouth has Super 6 this weekend, too. Yes, but I'm I'm pretty sure Troy will be in Sean because he's sponsoring the night. Okay, yeah. Pretty good <laughs> odds that he'll be there then. Pretty good odds. All right, Coach Cross, your second prediction. Uh, Tyler Courtney is going to have two wins and three podiums this week. Two wins and three podiums for Sunshine. Yeah, there is three. Okay. Yep. For Tyler Courtney. All right. I hope you're right because uh, I picked him as well. The Uper upcoming XR Super Series late model races, Proctor, Gondek, Law Speedway, and Ogilvy, just about a, basically a week away. They will average 30 or more late models participating in those events. Proctor, Gondek, and Ogilvy. 30 or more late models on average at those three races, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now, keep in mind, the world of outlaws, right, right now, we got 24, 25. That's not, That's no got. wonder why. Is, is Uper leading bold predictions? <laughs> yeah, not so why, bold, yeah. Why don't, why don't you, bold would be 40. Okay, Uper. Bold would I agree. So, so I'm that's calling a don- you out right now. You, you, that's you a ding. And- Is that a ding? Donkey ding right there from Uper. He, he's that's a, a donkey. Straight, he's a donkey regardless. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, yo, that I mean, he's, he's a Uper. I mean, it's basically Canada, right? I mean, yeah. it just it just is what he's third world country up there. I mean, Bert, the the Upper Peninsula isn't even Michigan. It's basically Wisconsin, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. People don't understand why it's part of Michigan. And 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 Krause, we know how Wisconsin people are. So what do you expect? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> kind of like, Alaska. Into that one. like Alaska. We just that wanted one. to own it, right? Right, right. <laughs> All right, Worker B, he's got his second one here. Going to need some verification on this. Going to need photos or video evidence to get this correct. I will get completely shit faced at I ninety four Thursday for the World of Outlaw Late Models. Prove it. Not true. Not true unless you fall in a fire, fall off a chair. I mean, we got to see some stupid shit or it don't count. Like, you just telling us that you're drunk, that don't count, right? But <laughs> you literally, like, falling down the hill and landing in the fence or something. Now, that shit right there, that that counts. So, we'll see how that works out. Beefcake. The Dirty 30. Kevin Burdick is going to double up at the Gondic Law speedway for the late model races this weekend at the border battle my second one i'm gonna go sycamore here the one to go show 83 cars dave dulciak will win his next night out at sycamore dave dulciak will find victory lane his next night out and on that same night his cousin brian will finish on the podium in his pier stock so it's going to be a good night for the 83 camp. All right, final lap around the track. Bert, your third and final prediction. Um, I'll go with uh, Nick Gareskovic will win the mods at ABC in the special on Thursday. All right, all right. The bounty hunter, the bounty hunter. A couple of years back, uh, Burdick dominated. He had like a year straight. He never lost a feature at Rapids. So we put a bounty on him. Nick Oreskovich came collected and uh, took that bounty. So good luck, Nick, at ABC Raceway. Coach Krause. Uh, we're going to Volunteer Speedway. We're going to go um, two out of the top three drivers on the podium are going to be non-Lucas, non-World of Outlaw drivers. Non Lucas, non Royal. Okay, so I could definitely see one of them being McDowell. Um, off the record, not counting, do you have another one that you're thinking could be the guy? Corey Hedgecock, maybe? Yeah, um, I would assume Overton's going there. Is he? I don't, I um, probably, you know, I, I, I don't know what what's Ricky Weiss got on his schedule. I think 
Another topic we didn't bring up, I should have brought it up, because I think a lot of drivers missed out at Lernerville. <laughs> Local guys, this is good money. You know what I mean? Right. And the field wasn't very quality by no means. So um, who knows? Maybe, maybe Ricky will show up and uh, get in the top three. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. All right. I think we can all agree that the Uper's second prediction was about as non-bold as you can get, right? So it was kind of, would, you, would we agree on that? So his third one, though, very bold. Very bold. He goes, this is extremely bold. In fact, it says right here, you're probably crying about my last prediction still. So I went with <laughs> a very bold one here. Coach Krause is going to have at least one A main win, A main win before July 31st. He goes, the guy can't even finish a race. So, like, I could have made a prediction that he actually finishes a feature, but he said Coach Krause will win at least one A main before July 31st of 2024, by the way. Um, so that that's super bold. I got to give him credit. That is extremely bold. Get that shit done. All right. All right. Worker B. Border battle. The mod race will be won by a driver that considers the Gondekla Speedway his home track. So I guess it's up for debate if that would be Sabraski if he wins, but I guess we'll feel that one out when we get there. Beefcake, his third and final prediction. High limit sprint cars, three different winners, and at least six drivers will have podium spots in the three nights that they race. Three different winners and at least six different drivers getting podium spots in the three nights. And my final prediction here, I am going to go, I'm going to go sprint car action. Talked a little bit about the high limit, shaking it up, letting drivers race wherever they want. Before the 2025 season, before the 2025 season, the World of Outlaw Sprint Car Series will make an announcement that they are no longer handcuffing their drivers and they will be able to erase as many races as they want that are non-sanctioned without getting penalized. So the World of Outlaw Sprint Cars will get rid of that handcuffing of their drivers in 2025. So, gentlemen, uh, pretty fun show. A lot of topics here this week. Hopefully everybody enjoyed. Any closing thoughts before we jump off on Episode 230? Uh, just, uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to the track. It's been a while. Well, I've been to the track other than last week. I've been to the track two weeks, the two weeks before, but didn't see much racing. So I, I want to see, full- see a full night. <laughs> there you go. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck. Hopefully, hopefully you guys raise some money there for uh, a good cause. And Shano Kraus victory lane this weekend, 29 star looking forward to seeing you finally get over the hide. If you can't, I mean, if you ain't going to win, wreck somebody. Are you doing double features at Viking the Speedway for this this weekend? Yeah, we are. We're doing our makeup feature that we're finally going to get in. So we're going to run that last just to get through the night and hopefully run that at the back. But uh, should be uh, should be a good, fun time and hopefully get some laps under my belt. There you go. Well, good luck this weekend. And fans, always give us some feedback. Let us uh, let us know if you have any questions, thoughts, predictions, whatever it may be. Thanks to all of our great sponsors. I'm Ryan. That's Bert. That's Coach. Thanks for tuning in to the One to Go Show. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please leave a review and subscribe. It is Puka. And Goat Sports has another show out there by podcast, Facebook, and YouTube. It's the Tea with Miss McGill show. Covers hockey, high school hockey in northern Minnesota. So if you're into hockey, you can find us on podcast under T with Miss McGill. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook, Goat Sports Media LLC. Uh, my, uh, yours truly and Coach Reed Larson, we break it down every week. We also do some interesting interviews. We'd love to have you. So tell your friends, tell your enemies, and we'll catch you next week.